What is up, Aiden Nation? Welcome to DAP Central. My name is Farid. As a part of today's highly anticipated live stream, I'm going to be joined by some of the biggest voices right now within Cardano to talk about everything stablecoin related. So as many of you within the community are aware, there's been a huge talking point, which has just been the adoption of USDC, or just a major player when it comes to the stablecoin game launching on Cardano. There's been two camps here, one side that is pro-USDC, and then there's another camp, which is pro-homegrown Cardano native asset. So without any further ado, we're going to jump right on in. We're going to kick things off with introductions. I'm going to bring everybody up here on stage. We do have a huge panel. We've got about 10 different guests here joining me. And then we're going to lay down the foundation, talk about some of the ground rules, make sure that we have a nice and healthy conversation. At the end of the day, this is actually what this is all about, right? Providing a medium for everybody to come together and have a healthy discussion, not one that is full of attacks, etc. So after we lay down the ground rules, we're going to talk about the problem. I'm going to kind of lay things out out. And then I'm going to turn it over to all the panelists to give their sides and just their perspectives here. So I hope you guys find this to be super helpful and that you guys find this to be um, entertaining as well, right? But if you guys do, make sure to go ahead and smash that thumbs up, share this out. We're, gonna, we're about to get things started off um, just with the introduction. So first and foremost, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off here with Temujin from Wanchain. Tim, welcome along. You and I actually just shot an interview not too long ago, breaking down what Wanchain is doing and just everything that Wanchain has brought over into Cardano. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing really well. Glad to be here. And I'm looking forward to these conversations with all these uh, wonderful guests. Likewise. Thank you for your time. Next, we've got two members coming in from the official Mahen team. First and foremost, we've got their CEO and president. That's going to be Matt Ploman. Matt, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Hello. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. You've also got the lead developer. That's going to be Matthew Tristan. Quite quite the gang of mats there coming in from Mahen. Good morning, Plutus. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I, I would describe myself more as like the blockchain developer than the lead developer. But Perfect. I appreciate and, that. And Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just do the blockchain stuff. Perfect. Perfect. Next, we've got a fellow content creator. He's joined me on quite a few live streams before. That's going to be none other than LGC Josh or Josh from Late Game Crypto. Josh, welcome along. What's up? Thanks so much for having me. You know, I I got a shout out. Like it's it's I appreciate you hosting a, a discussion like this because this whole uh, getting together of members of the community to talk about what's going on here. Um, that's that's what you know decentralized ecosystems and communities are supposed to be all about. So I, I appreciate this. This is cool to be a part of. Not a problem. Um, I can't code, you know, but what I can do is create content and loop everybody in to talk about high, high, high and important topics. So um, I appreciate that shout out. Let's keep things moving along. We've got two members here joining us from the Fluid Tokens team, right? Um, we've got Mateo. Let me bring him up. Mateo, good morning. How are you? Hey guys, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. I'm Matteo, the CEO of Free Tokens. And uh, yeah, j just to underline this, uh, Michele is not from the Free Tokens team. So he's actually from Harmonic Labs, and we are working together on several projects. Thank you. I appreciate that. And just to lay down the ground rules, guys, I'm not perfect. If I miss anything up as a part of today's live stream, do not hesitate to correct me. I appreciate that correction there, Matteo. Next, we've got Michele. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Um... I'm Michaela, as Matteo said, I'm the founder of uh, Harmonic Laboratories, and uh, I'm here mainly because I proposed uh, the possible ERC20 standard on Cardano. So we're excited to talk about this later. Yes, that's going to be one of the big talking points here on our agenda, and I'm going to break that down in just a minute. Thank you for joining us, Michele. Next, we've got Synth Lover, Robert from Mint. Robert, good morning. How are you? Well, it's good evening for me. But yeah, thank you, Farad, for joining. This is going to be a great discussion. I'm looking forward to it. I scheduled an hour. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be enough for everybody to kind of get their thoughts out there, but we're going to do our best to go ahead and do that. And, you know, I think this might go on for an hour, but if anybody here has to drop, again, do not hesitate to go ahead and do so. Um, I appreciate all you guys joining me. Now, last but definitely not least, he's also joined me here on a few of these live streams. That's going to be Trim Brousset. Now, Trim's got some pretty close ties to IOG, but I do want to go ahead and quickly state that none of his opinions today are going to be representative or tied directly back to IOG. So, Trim, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm uh, you know, blessed to be uh, be invited to the stream. Not a problem, not a problem. Now, I did misspeak. We've actually got one more member 
who's in the backstage right now. That's going to be Sheldon Hunt representing the Intersect MBO. Sheldon, I said you're sitting on top of the board. How are you? <laughs> Wonderful to be here, guys. Uh, really appreciate being on this incredibly established and esteemed panel. So can't wait for the conversations to come. But yeah, thanks yeah. again for having me. You're welcome. Um, I'm super excited again. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. Now that we've got everybody on board, let's just quickly go through some of the ground rules and then we're going to jump straight into the actual discussion. So um, let me just go ahead and let me do this very quickly. So <clears throat> ground rules, first and foremost, no personal or project attacks. Again, I don't think that this needs to be said. Um, everybody that I've brought up here, I've had um, personal one on one chat, chats with. Um, and I think that that shouldn't be any issue moving forward. Next is just going to be no swearing, just watch your language and no interruption. So when anybody else is speaking, just do make sure to be respectful. Um, I would ask that if you guys are not speaking, just make sure to go ahead and mute yourselves. It really does make things a lot easier. That way, there's just no backup, uh, back background noise or any sort of echoes, et cetera, like that. Um, next, no shilling. You know, um, this is an open conversation, but please do be respectful, everybody. This is not the time to, you know, promote your NFTs and do all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then I would also encourage you guys to just go ahead and as people are speaking, um, I'll bring them up in the spotlight, just like I'm right now in the spotlight um, to just keep your responses to about two to three minutes so everybody can get a, a turn to speak. If you do want to go ahead and speak, feel free to raise your hand. I'll be keeping track of people as they raise their hands. You don't have to keep them up the entire time, but I'll just make notes here as the conversation conversation begins to heat up. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, if you want to make any rebuttals, make sure to just go ahead and write some notes down. That way, when we do bring you up to speak, you guys can be quick and concise again, because there's 10 of us here as a part of this um, panel. So the very last thing is going to be lightning pole. So as a part of the agenda that I sent out to you guys, if you guys did not take a chance to look at that, please make sure to go ahead and do so now. Um, there's four lightning poles. These are going to be some poles, and I'm actually going to pose them to you guys here on the panel, but I'm also going to go ahead and actually pose them to the viewers in the audience as well, right? So the first uh, lightning pole will actually be surrounding the type of stable coins that you all prefer, and make sure to keep these lightning pole responses to just the actual answer, um, no explanations. Um, that'll be a quick um, sort of engagement session just to kind of um, feel exactly what everybody or to get an idea as to where everybody stands. So now that we got that out of the way, let me bring everybody back up here. The problem, I'll just kind of lay the ground work here and then whoever's got their hands up first, will kind of get the conversation rolling. As it states right now on Cardano, we have um, a couple of stable coins, right? Kicking things off with Indigo, um, they have IUSD. We've also got Jed, right, which launched back in February of um, 2023. Let me make sure I'm speaking correctly there. We've also got Mint, who's represented by Robert here. And then we also have Wrap USDC, Wrap USDT, and Wrap Die coming in from the Wanchain Bridge. So we've got quite the, the number of stable coins right now. However, we do have some stable coins that are also upcoming. That includes USDM, USDA, and potentially native USDC and USDT. Now, one of the things that has been um, sort of a token point is the fact that Cardano's somewhat trailing, right, when we're taking a look at stable coins compared to other ecosystems. Specifically, when we take a look at Cardano versus Avalanche, Avalanche has about um, $800 million worth of TVL versus Cardano at about $350 million worth of TVL. So Cardano needs about a 2x to get to the TVL that Avalanche as well as Matic have. However, when we take a look at the stablecoin comparison, there's a bigger discrepancy, right, where Cardano needs a 50x increase in terms of stablecoin um market cap to catch up to Avalanche and or Matic. So that's kind of been the issue, right? The fact that Cardano is not lagging too far behind in terms of TVL, but we're lagging in a big way when it comes to stable coins. Um, right now, I believe if I'm not mistaken, that we have over $18 million worth of stable coin value on Cardano. And again, that's mainly contributing from um, IUSD coming from Indigo. And then we've also got um, Jed coming in from Cody. So I'll kind of turn it over to the speakers now, um, if anybody wants to kind of kick off the conversation, but just surrounding the problem, what are you guys' initial thoughts about Cardano, liquidity, stable coins, or just the comparison between Cardano, Avalanche, and Matic, and some of these other um, similar L1s? Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, so um, I, I think uh, the the state of the ecosystem where it's at right now, um, we're, we're still a very young ecosystem. Uh, people oftentimes 
uh, pair Cardano up to like older blockchains, like, you know, Ethereum and some of the stuff that, that's been established for a while. But smart contracts on Cardano has only existed for like a, a couple of years now. Um, we're, we're taking the slow and steady approach. And in that process, uh, yeah, we don't have stable coins right now because we have been developing from the ground up for, for actually not as much time as uh, a lot of these other uh, blockchain ecosystems. So I, I'm very much on the side of uh, stable coin diversity. I think that more stable coins is always a good thing. People having options to select where they want their money to go. Um, and uh, I, I think that the the direction that the ecosystem is headed uh, is not something that I think is is super fair to compare to where other blockchains are at right now. Um, we're 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 doing things differently. We're building things with a different underlying philosophy. We're doing things at a different pace. Uh, it, it will come. Uh, solutions are being built, and uh, the longer term future of Cardano, I, I think, is really really bright. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in there? Not everybody go at once, Trim. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, to to sort of echo um, Josh's point there that I think there's a room for all kinds of stablecoins, especially you know this this type diversity. So at the moment we do have uh, an algorithmic stablecoin Jed and a synthetic stablecoin IUSD, and you know a bridged version of USDT and USDC. Um, with fiat-backed stablecoins as well, you know, we have sort of most areas covered and it's not a, you know, one solution fits every problem kind of situation. It's, you know, synthetic coins uh, or synthetic IOSD, for example, has a particular purpose. Same thing with, with JED is, is a very cool experiment that I, I think is, is, you know, well worth keeping in the ecosystem and I, that I've participated in myself. And Depending on what, what you're doing, in, in if you're you know working with DeFi actively, there is use for all of these, right? Um, Fiat-backed stablecoins tend to have you know a much more stable peg, whereas these other ones may may shift around a little bit. But the other ones, you know, the synthetic assets and and the algorithmic uh, stablecoins tend to be more um, quick to deploy and quick to redeem, and you know it, it's it's faster to move in and out if you want to do uh, do arbitrage. So there, there's definitely room for all of these, I think. And you know, adding fiat-backed uh, stable coins to the mix is, is I think, vital for, for the DeFi ecosystem to sort of blossom the, the way that it should, because they have a, a different mechanism to, to maintain the peg. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see these, these developments that are, that are happening. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of put this into perspective, We've got Josh giving you a 10 out of 10. Great response there, Trim. Um, we take a look at the, the DEX ecosystem. Right? We've got Wing Riders, Sunday Swap, Min Swap, you know, Meow Swap, all these protocols that are all doing the same exact thing, right? Some of them make it, some of them don't. Um, very similar with wallets, Nami, Uroi, Typhon. You know, you, you have your pick. And so I think it, it should be no different to have the same sort of um, strategy here when it comes to stable coins on Cardano, right? Whether that's JED, IUSD, or not IUSD, um, yeah, JED, IUSD, you know, Mahan USDM, USDT, et cetera, the more options, the better. Now we're going to kind of keep the, the conversation moving here, but before we do that, I want to go and just kind of kick off the first lightning poll. So does anybody want to chime in with respect to just the problem and the state of stable coins on Cardano before we jump into the first lightning poll? If I could just one, we'll add one little piece. I remember thinking back before Jed's launch that there was a great deal of speculation that the launch of Jed and its over collateralized nature <clears throat> would be a pumping effect for ADA and that it would be so popular. It would suck so much ADA, so many, so much value into the ecosystem and it would suck so much ADA out of circulation and into the JET smart contract that there was, you know, a, a palpable feeling of excitement for JED to potentially be there to, to, to pump ADA and provide an additional use case for ADA. And I think that we saw that it was really not that big of a forcing mechanism for improving ADA's valuation. But I think that it's really, you know, we, we only really, really see what we lack. You know, we see where, where others are, where other chains have, um, have what they, what they've built, what kind of use cases and integrations they have on, you know, some of these Ethereum based chains. And 
you know, we, we noticed that there's no fiat backed stablecoin on Cardano, but if you're in the position of making a fiat backed stablecoin, you think about so many other things and you know, it, it does, it does increase the, like the, the base layer or the, 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 the pairing off effect of using a fiat backed stablecoin. It can be scalable. It can be easily redeemed, but to the extent that it's, you know, a, a dollar that doesn't go through the crypto channel, maybe it's slightly more useful, but I think that there's a lot more happening in Cardano than just, you know, lacking a stable coin that there's, there's a whole lot more that, that can be built if we had, you know, sufficient liquidity and sufficient circulating supply of, you know, of, of good, um, you know, good project tokens and that kind of thing. Thanks, Matt. You raised some great points. We're actually going to jump into that. Josh agrees that we're there with you as well. Um, I, I did skip out on the agenda earlier. So now that we've got the ground rules set up and we've kind of talked about the foundation, which is you know just the, the state of stable coins on Cardano, we're gonna take this first lightning poll here. Let me make sure just go ahead and just get the poll up. So for all the, the panelists here, my first question to you all is, what type of stable coin do you prefer most? Again, we're just gonna kind of go down the line. Um, feel free to unmute yourselves, uh, but no explanations. You can just pick one of the three options. Option number one is fiat slash commodity backed, number two, crypto backed, and then number three is kind of a joint category, synthetic slash algorithmic. For the viewers, I'm also going to be going ahead and putting up a poll right now. If you guys are watching live, that poll should pop up now. So go ahead and feel free to go ahead and enter your choices there as well. Um, before we actually jump into the responses for the viewers, once we're done with this first poll, the next thing we're going to jump into is just the conversation surrounding USDC. So we're going to touch on some of the pros of USDC, again, natively on Cardano and some of the potential cons. Following that, we're going to jump into some of the pros and cons for homegrown stable coins, which we're going to categorize as stable coins actually built directly within Cardano, not something that's built outside of Cardano aiming to launch directly on Cardano or integrate into Cardano. Following that, we're going to give the spotlight over to Matteo and Michele to talk about their ERC-20 Cardano smart contracts, which I believe will be bringing some new use cases here. And so we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what they've been building and how they've been implementing that and when we could potentially see something like that coming live. And then last but not least, we're going to jump into bridge phobia, right? So um, one thing that I've seen, um, and this I think is just crossing any network, is the fact that people are always hesitant to utilize bridge platforms. So I want to kind of talk about how we can actually um, get over that stigma. We've got Temujin here representing one chain. And then as I mentioned earlier, we've got Trim, who's got a lot of experience working on bridging specifically um, with IOG. So now that the first poll is out, um, the, the responses are coming in from the viewers. Um, maybe let's just kick things off here. Matt, you're on the top left-hand corner of my screen. Of those three options, which would you pick? Again, we're just going to go straight down the line. So Tim, Trim, Matt, get yourself ready. If I had to choose, I would pick uh, either Fiat Backed or one of the vault style stable coins where it brings together a you know, large, large collaboration of, of tokens. Or do you? Yep. Fiat backed. I I actually prefer algorithmic or, or um, synthetic assets. I like uh, fiat backed. I'll go synthetic. Um, I'm. <laughs> I don't don't really have a preference. Uh, I think since we are talking about. Uh, back to to uh, an asset that is of the government centralization is not an issue so i will go with the app in that case matteo uh consider yes considering the current stage of the blockchain ecosystem in general i say fiat baked for now i will also go with fiat backed over to you josh yeah same sentiment in the current stage of the technology in the industry i'd say fiat backed and then lastly, Sheldon. I think you're so still- yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> you caught me there. But yes, I would actually say much the same that uh, the reality of the world that we live in today would have to be number one fiat based. But you know, where we want to be in 10, 15, 20 years from now, synthetic, but got to be realistic. Thank you. I appreciate that. Taking a look at the poll right now from the audience, we've got 77% coming in with fiat slash commodity backed. We've got 12% for crypto backed and then 9% for synthetic and algorithmic. So again, just taking a look at some of these preliminary numbers, it looks like the majority will be um, 
choosing to utilize something like a fiat backed stable coin again, which is why I think this is such a huge topic for today's video. Now, this is not to set anybody up. The majority of the panelists, including myself, actually all selected fiat back. But I had a really good comment that came in on one of my YouTube videos stating if the goal of crypto is to get away right from the fiat system, which we all know is being debased as we speak, why would it make sense or why would we want to actually utilize a stable coin backed by fiat? Again, not trying to put anybody on the spot here, right? Uh, but anybody maybe just kind of want to weigh in on that perspective. If not, that's completely okay. We'll move over into this next segment. So I saw Josh's hand come up first and then Mateo, we're coming over to you next. Yeah, so um, it, uh, how I how I feel about that comment is kind of the same way that I feel about uh, the concept of decentralization, generally speaking. You can't just jump into a like fully decentralized system from the get go. Uh, things have the, the foundations of it have to be built. The transition needs to be made into a world where that is a a sustainable uh, system to operate from, where where um, you know all the rules are understood uh, in the same way with finance people are currently using fiat to to do their their day-to-day -day lives their personal finance businesses operate off of fiat if we're going to transition into a world where decentralized systems are what are running all of our day-to-day -day lives um we we have to start with the tools that are being used uh, and then we can start experimenting with and building and developing on uh, alternative systems that that uh, can develop more trust from that point. So it's a uh, it's it's not an either or. It's a it's a both and and it's a process. Thank you, Josh. Over to you, Mateo. I actually completely agree with Josh. Uh, the same idea is. Now people, the mindset in general of people is based on traditional field. So we see that uh, the blockchain currencies are still like uh, an innovative and very small uh, set of the general economy. And also coming from the business perspective, so from the big players that have huge liquidity to use, to invest and to move, uh, they still think uh, for, uh, with a, you know, using USDC, uh, sorry, USD in general as as a you know point of reference for the calculations of their movements. So it's, it's now is not the moment to have everything uh, you know um, valued uh, with with cryptos, but instead still with uh, dollars, for example, euros and whatever, and slowly moving from there in a, in the years. But it will take some time because the mindset of people of people must change. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump in? If not, we'll kind of keep the conversation rolling. Well, go yeah, ahead, I'd be happy to. Nope. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. no, 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 no. Go ahead, Sheldon. And then coming <laughs> over to you, Robert. All right. Well, I, I guess like we're probably all going to be more or less on the same page uh, now that I think there's a, been a bit of a more general realization across the industry that this is going to be an evolution, not a revolution. Uh, I know that's perhaps not as exciting for everybody, but it's just the reality. We need to go where the people are. Um, and sometimes we forget that we're still early. And this is something that I have to remind myself again and again, because we end up admittedly a little bit down our own rabbit hole often, and we forget the wider context of the world within which we live today. So uh, we will get there, but we just have to kind of go along with the tempo of the, the world we're in today. And so uh, Fiat, is a necessary evil. Uh, I think we can maybe agree with the terminology on that, um, but it is not the end. And I just want to stress this is something that will keep on going long into the future. So those are my two cents. And so kind of echoing, I guess, the other guys, but well, I'll turn it over now. Robert, go ahead. Yeah, just kind of like echoing on that sentiment. Like I see fiat as a stepping stone, right? Like first is like we have to integrate into the existing world before we can replace the existing system. So ideologically, I, I, I want a better system, but before we can get there, we have all these smaller steps that we have to overcome. So, you know, that's why I voted synthetic because 
that's the ultimate goal. No, I, I don't even want a, a fiat backed stablecoin. I don't want something tied to the US dollar or the euro. I want something that has stable value that's not pegged to a centralized entity like a government. But that's a, a longer term vision and it's going to take a long time for us to get there. So before we get there, we do have to take these stepping stones where we integrate with a fiat system and then we have the crypto backed assets, we have the synthetic assets. So far, all the algorithmic stable coins have failed us. At some point, they're not going to fail. We will get there eventually. We just got to figure it out. Um, but you no, know, I think everyone here on the panel is kind of striving towards that same end goal. It's just uh, we do have to acknowledge that we've got to take some smaller steps to get there. Thank you for that, Robert. I appreciate that. Um, for anybody who's not aware, <laughs> 10 of 10, Ro Robert, I think, has a lot of experience with synthetics because, again, he's actually working to develop Mint, which um, is bringing um, synthetic uh, stable coins to and from Cardano, right? Um, they're aiming to go multi-chain. I sat down with him not too long ago. So unless there's any closing comments here, we're going to jump into, oh, Tim, happy to hear you. Go for it. Yeah, I just um, won't, won't totally echo what everyone else on the panel is saying. Um, me personally, and I think a lot of a lot of people, the end goal is not necessarily the complete downfall of fiat currencies. Um, you know, there's a lot of benefits, um, you know, that blockchain can bring to the world. And for me, that's kind of more the end goal. You know, I want to have a decentralized system, but basically I want the run, I want the world to run on blockchain. Now there's certain things we need to be realistic. Um, you know, the U S dollar is going to continue to exist. Now there's these different data points, these different off chain assets that exist and okay, we want to be able to kind of transact with them to access that value on chain, but the, the underlying asset itself is, is off chain. So, you know, if you're concerned about, um, you know, fiat backed stable coin, okay. I think algorithmic coins, synthetics, these are really cool. And in some ways, you know, they, they fit the ethos of true decentralization, but it kind of creates an interesting dilemma if the thing that you're trying to uh, simulate with the synthetics is the USD value. Whether or not you're doing it in a quote unquote decentralized way, the value itself that you're trying to simulate and to peg yourself to is still going to inherit these, you know, supposed downsides of having it from a from a centralized system because the value itself is is already touched by centralization. So, you know, I agree it's an evolution. Things are going to go slowly, but the, you know, I don't know if I totally agree that. Our end goal here is no fiat currency full replacement because then why are we even trying to peg anything to USD at all? I apologize. I was muted. Um, I appreciate the, those points that you made there, Tim. Um, for me, I was just going to say, you know, if if we get the gradual shift away from fiat backed, where do you guys see the next sort of uh, stable coin being adopted, right? If it's not fiat backed, um, again, maybe just a, a couple of you guys, if you guys want to take a shot, if not, that's okay. We'll, we'll move into the pros and cons of USDC. Josh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that that Tem's point of view is uh, perfectly like valid. You know, I, I think that uh, of those of us that are really in this whole thing for the um, sort of uh, libertarian freedom of the people type of uh, perspective that that also comes from an ideological uh, standpoint too. And people from different perspectives that want different things want to use blockchain for different purposes. Uh, my my hope would be for like the, the, the very long-term future, like the idealistic world would be uh, the need for no stable coins whatsoever. Uh, and we're probably talking like, 40, 50 years down the road, if we're being totally honest. Um, but government owned money um, is is generally damaging uh, because it's, it's central control tends to uh, devalue it. it. It tends to um, encourage a lot of wars to happen. That's, you know, that's the problem with with government controlled money generally. 
Um, so the, the hope would be, I would love a world where like, you know, we're transacting in ADA on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's, it's not totally far-fetched. People in the Philippines used Axie uh, just a, a few years ago mm -hmm. as like their regular transaction. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the ideal world that I'd like to see. I, I, uh, do I expect it to happen? I'm not totally sure. Bitcoin could very well become like a reserve currency that a lot of governments adopt to back their, uh, their, their government controlled money. Um, it's a, it's a step in the right direction, but it's not the ideal world that I'd like to see. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. I've got a couple of friends that are new to crypto and they're always asking me, um, and Mate, I'm coming to you in just a second. Um, you know, what's the point of having ADA if we're not actually ever spending it or, or, or utilizing it? Right. Um, one thing I want to just quickly go ahead and answer, and I do see tons of questions and comments rolling in. Um, everybody tuning in, first and foremost, thank you all for tuning in. Um, we will be taking questions from the community here in, in just a little bit. Again, we're just kind of getting through our very first topic. We've got one question coming in here from Star Trader, which is asking, what is USDA? Um, Star Trader, if you're not aware, USDA is the stable coin, which is being backed right now by Emergo. Um, in Anzins, I believe it's supposed to be a fiat stable, fiat backed stable coin, um, very similar to USDM um, and very similar to USDC as well. Now, granted, this would be built, you know, by one of the three founding arms of Cardano, right, which would um, be somewhat of a homegrown approach. And so I would kind of chalk this up to be in the same camp as USDM. And again, we're going to be jumping into that here in just a second. If you do want to find out more about USDA, um, you can head over to the official website, which is available. It should be on screen now at ansens.com. Again, it states here, um, USDA will be backed one-to-one -one with the US dollar fueled by Cardano with regulatory compliance. Um, okay. Um, Roki, we will try to get you on here towards the latter end of the call as well. I know that you're very vocal about stable coins. Let's keep the conversation moving into the second topic or the second um, section here for the stream. So next, I want to talk about USDC and whether or not it's a net positive or net negative. I'm sure Josh can attest to this here, right? Um, as a content creator, our job is to deliver the news. But a lot of times we get caught in the crossfire when we're trying to deliver the, that news. And there's just been more and more content coming out about USDC and whether or not it's needed. And every time that I personally release content about, you know, the benefits or even some of the drawbacks that try to just be as fair as possible, right? It's not my job to tell people whether or not we need USDC or whether or not we don't. It's my job to just provide the facts and let the people make their decisions. A lot of times I'm caught in the crossfire and that comes through the YouTube comments. So I ran a poll. Uh, this was about, I would say a month ago and 83% of my viewers, again, I'm not speaking of everybody, were on the fence or were on the side of, of saying, hey, we need USDC. So some of those pros, and none of this has been proven yet, right? But some of those pros include the fact that that would bring additional liquidity and that would boost our DeFi ecosystem. I think that's probably the biggest thing or the biggest argument that people would say is why we need USDC on Cardano. The next would just be wider Cardano adoption, right? So there was a developer report that came out not too long ago, and it stated that Cardano is kind of like on this island by itself, where we don't really have a lot of cross-chain developers compared to other EVM networks, right? And so the, the theory is here that when we integrate something like USDC, right, that this would also bring in interoperability and that this would kind of uh, create this bridge between Cardano and some of these other networks where USDC or that stable coin is interoperable with. One other thing I do want to quickly highlight is if you guys are not aware, is that um, USDC does offer what they call their CCTP protocol, right? Or their cross-chain transfer protocol. Let me quickly pull this up on the screen. If you guys aren't aware, again, you can head over to the official website. But this breaks down the fact that USDC or Circle actually has their own native bridging mechanism. So this is not um, a third-party bridging partner but this is their own built-in way of moving USDC from one network to another, right? So this kind of illustrates that process here. Now, this right now, I believe, is only working with ERC-20 compatible tokens, but the hope would be that if Cardano is... Uh, if Cardano gets support for USDC, that we could potentially see, you know, it also falling into the CCTP protocol. Um, if you guys missed my video with Tem, um, this was shot about two to three days ago. We did dive, in, dive deeper into CCTP and what that could potentially bring in. Now, that is on the positive side of things, right? We've talked about liquidity, wider adoption, interoperability. And lastly, it's just the fact that Circle is a tried and tested entity, right? Uh, they've got millions of dollars, billions of dollars, I should actually say, in the reserves. I believe it's about $29 billion. And that is one of the biggest things that people say when they're saying, hey, we want to bring Circle over. Like, this is not their first rodeo. They've done this before. So those are all of the pros 
on adopting USDC. Again, to be fair, looking at the cons now, the first is the fact that when we've been speaking about this, the the eight figures always pops up, whether that's $10 million all the way up to $99 million. Charles has always kind of mentioned $10 million, so we'll just kind of use that as the, as the number for now, but eight figures could be anything within that range. So that would have to come from the Cardano community, whether that comes through Emergo, um, IOG, the Cardano Foundation collaborating and putting up those funds, that's a whole nother conversation. But as we know right now, there's going to be some sort of eight figure amount. Now, I think we've confirmed that Catalyst cannot be used and that something like the Cardano Treasury through the through Intersect, right, which Sheldon is actually representing today, um, could be the path forward. Now, we would have to wait until SIP number 1694 comes about, which is um, surrounding governance and actually gives the power back to the Intersect MBO to make some of those bigger decisions. Now, that is the biggest con. The second one, and actually before I, I wrap that up, every time that I mention that price tag, people leave comments on my video saying, why, why does Cardano have to pay? Have any other networks or have any other EVM uh, uh, platforms that have integrated USDC actually paid? I have not found any data. I would love to hear if anybody here has found data um, or has confirmed that you know these people have uh, paid. Sheldon, we'll, we'll come to you for that. Um, let me just wrap up these cons. And then the second is if Circle is making money off of Cardano, right? I think Charles mentioned that they'd be able to make over eight figures yearly if they're integrated to Cardano. Why do we have to even pay this initial starting amount? And I've thought about that. And I've actually had some conversations with other members on the panel. And another piece is Circle is a business. At the end of the day, they're a for-profit business. So I want to kind of hammer that as well. And I would love to hear what some of the panels have to say about that particular point. Why do we have to pay early on to integrate if they're going to make that much on our back? The next is the freezing clawbacks and blacklisting. I think this is probably going to be the, the most controversial piece here. Um, people say that this goes directly against Cardano's beliefs that we don't need these things, that we don't need these features. Uh, but then looking on the other side of the coin, people say, hey, you know, they're a regulated entity. If we don't want to get in trouble, we have to do things in a regulated manner. Therefore, we need freezing clawbacks, blacklisting. Again, we're going to get this conversation rolling. I'm just laying the foundation and then you guys can all jump in. Next is going to be surrounding securities, right? If we get Charles paying for it, if we get the Cardano Foundation paying for it, if we get IOG paying for it, could that be seen as a way to boost the price of Cardano, therefore giving more heat to the argument that Cardano is a security? As every panelist, I'm sure, is aware, we already have Binance and Coinbase being sued, right, by the SEC for, quote unquote, operating as securities brokers and exchange dealers. Um, I believe everybody here believes that Cardano isn't a security, but this could potentially be uh, additional fire, right, for the or ammunition for the SEC to utilize against Cardano. Um, very lastly, um, we've talked about Cardano's reputation being stained again. A lot of people don't like USDC. They think that, you know, they're not doing things the right way and that adopting USDC could basically stain Cardano's reputation. Um, and then there's monopolistic risk. You know, if we only get USDC and we only focus on USDC and they do have some sort of issue, a Black Swan event, we saw SVB closing not too long ago and that, you know, um, deep peg circles uh, stablecoin for a little bit, what could that cause in the near future? So that was quite the rant for me. I'm going to turn it over to you guys now. Um, we will be taking some comments here from the community in just a minute. But we talked about the pros. We talked about the cons. I think I saw Sheldon's hand go up first. Um, once Sheldon is done, I'll just kind of turn it over to anybody. You guys feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, and, you know, we'll just kind of proceed that way. So Sheldon, over to you. Yes, okay. Well, well wonderful synopsis on the, the pros and the cons. Uh, yeah, I'll just quickly comment on the, the cons because... It is something that does come up quite a bit, and I think there is an element of, and this is, I think, by design, it, it's quite confusing. Like, the whole setup with Circle is quite opaque. So just so everybody knows, uh, I've actually been in communication with the, the, some of the teams that have been working with Circle previously, uh, years past, in getting uh, Circle onto um, uh, Polygon and Polkadot and some other chains. And so I've gotten a bit of like an insight into how some of these chains went about adopting uh, circle and it's quite interesting so they're very hard negotiators they're very strict on their ndas and everything is customized 
So that's why we get these numbers that are all over the place. So I talked with John McPherson, previously of the Cardano Foundation. He had been the one who kind of kicked off the conversation with Circle some years ago with the CF. Uh, and the numbers at the start spooked the CF, and they were not keen to negotiate any further. Um, but hearing what uh, Polkadot has done, it turns out that there's a lot of negotiation that goes into it. Uh, Circle can be pretty brutal about it. Um, there are some chains, I can't name names, but there's some chains that have actually paid nothing to have uh, Circle come over and be adopted on their chain in return for some other back end back scratch. Uh, it could be kind of a guarantee of liquidity. Uh, there's all kinds of different things that go into these negoci negotiations, sorry. So uh, we can't really come out and say, it's gonna cost this amount. We still don't know. It will probably take months of negotiations to actually get to a point where we've got like an actual firm idea about what the number would be. Um, but I, I think we could get to a number if the community's for it, but that's a whole other topic. But um, before closing out like on the numbers, um, one thing that we do need to be honest with ourselves about is if we are going to bring Circle or Tether, because we also need to kind of keep these guys on the table as well. I know they're the kind of red-headed red stepchilds. No one really wants to acknowledge them, but they are a fairly big player in the ecosystem overall. So, um, but yeah, but with both of these guys, we would need to put quite a bit of money on the table just to get stood up liquidity wise. Uh, and that, from my understanding, is around $10 million just to get some kickstarted liquidity. Uh, and it'll probably be more than that. So we were talking about $18 million currently in all stable coins across Cardano. We're gonna need to double that at a minimum to get USDC going, um, which is maybe not a bad thing at all. Um, so yeah, but the last point, I'm sorry I'm rambling on here, but it's the community side of things. Uh, you made a very good point there before, like we're gonna need to have SIP 694 go live to have the community be able to vote on this, to be able to like go out and finally interact with the treasury in a meaningful way. And so, even if we get going on it now, we're probably going to have months of internal discussions as a community. We're going to need to have a vote. It could get ugly, but we need to be ready for that. Uh, and we need to be able to get ready to actually put together a solid bulletproof proposal uh, because it might be the most important proposal and maybe even the first one we put to the wider community with SIP 1694. So um, yeah, this is kind of a, a call to action for you guys and for everybody listening in. If, if you're keen on doing this, uh, Let's go. Uh, I would love to hear your, uh, your thoughts on this. And please come and join Intersect. We've got a, a stablecoin working group that's being set up this week. So uh, you will be able to, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll have my uh, contact details out there. But for now, yeah, please come to the website, sign up. We'll get you added to the Discord and you'll find there's the stablecoin working group. Um, and so I think that'll be one of the houses of discussion going forward, but not the only one. So yeah, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over. Thanks, guys, for listening to me. Hey, Farid, you're on I, you're muted. Yeah. I apologize. I'm trying to make sure not to speak over everybody. And so I'm muting myself when I'm not, when I'm listening to everybody else. Um, I was just going to say, just to kind of plug in the website, it's intersectmbo.org. Um, I did see a couple of hands go up. Um, Tem, I think you had something to say. Did anybody else want to jump in there before Tem? Or did, were you just trying to alert me that my mic was muted? Just trying to Mateo? alert you. Okay, Mateo, I think you have something to say? Yes, yes. So just... Uh, Let's we before these we talk about different type of stable coins, right? Synthetics and algorithmic and fiat baked. And I think USDC is a different type of fiat baked stable coins. For example, compared to USDM, and I think they have they serve different purposes inside the Cardano ecosystem for this initial phase of the stable coins environment. Uh, I'm a huge supporter of USDM, but uh, when with Fluid Tokens, I go and talk with uh, traditional businesses that want to create blockchain solutions on different blockchains, but we try to bring them on Cardano. One of the major painful topics are the stable coins. They only know about USDC and eventually USDT. So the, all the millions of assets that they can bring onto the chain with their businesses we are not able to bring them because uh, they don't, they cannot trust m smaller and not well-known stable coins. Everybody knows USDC because it's not only on Cardano, it's everywhere. And therefore this business says we want to transact only using USDCs or USDT. 
And this is painful for us because we know we have valid other options, but it needs they need to um, pass the test of time. We, Circle has been here since the beginning, I say, USDT as well in the blockchain environment. This is why they are trusted by businesses. And with time, we will be able to show them that they are not the only good options and there are probably better options. Uh, but for now, for an initial bootstrap where businesses can be onboarded into Cardano, we need USDC. And this is why uh, with Mikhail, I'm working on the proposal for implementing them native, um, without changes to the, to the blockchain. Thank you, Matteo. Sounds like we've got a community member here which agrees with you, right? Exactly. It's about mainstream adoption. Um, an interesting comment here, also rolling in here from Freak, stating, you have USDC on Cardano. WTF is the problem. One chain and Mint provide it. That is true, but that actually highlights that that last topic that I want to jump into, right? Which is the bridge phobia. Um, I've provided content here with uh, Tem on the channel. And a lot of people like Wanchain. Um, I can definitely see that on Twitter, but every once in a while I get the comments that say, hey, I've had this bad experience on a bridge before, uh, most notably the Nomad bridge, right? Therefore, I'm no longer trusting any bridge. So again, we're going to jump into that question freak a little bit more and into that topic a little bit more to talk about, you know, why people have that phobia and what can we do to reverse that? Because that is true. We do technically have USDC on Cardano. And even when I released the video, I, I kind of put that on, on my title, like we already have USDC on Cardano. But people are like, no, it's not native, you know. So um, I did release another video talking about the differences between native USDC and a bridge version of USDC, which again, both of them do have their ups and downs. So that's an entire conversation on its own. Um, I'm going to kind of step back now. Um, anybody else want to chime in surrounding the pros or cons of USDC on Cardano? Um, I saw Josh. Now, Josh, you did speak a little bit ago. So I'm going to give this one to Robert first, and then I'll come over to you. And then we're going to launch our second lightning poll. Um, and I'll just kind of prep the audience right now. Um, again, this is everything aside, right? And I'm not talking about any homegrown stable coin, just focusing specifically on USDC. Do you see that as a net positive or a net negative? Over to you, Robert, and then back over to you, Josh. Yeah, thanks. So I think a lot of people, like even on the panel and in the community, agree that USDC would be good for Cardano. Where a lot of the controversy comes from is, you know, is it worth the cost? And there's a few elements to this because we've been in negotiations with Circle and Tether and Paxos and all these other stablecoin companies for the last two or three years. So personally, I've been involved since 2022. And it's not just about money. I think if it was just about money and we could write like a check, we'd be able to find that money somewhere and get it onboarded. Um, but I think Sheldon brought up this point before, like these negotiations are really, really brutal. Um, because when you go into the circle boardroom, boardroom, it's like you have to pay a fee to have the conversation. And then they come up with a longer list of demands. So the last time we went to circle, it was 10 million deposit plus we need the ability to freeze. And then you know, that's where the negotiation starts. And then they, they keep on adding requirement after requirement after requirement. If you look at these documents, they are really, really, really long. Um, so it's not just about money. It's a very long process. And it's just a matter of like, do we as a community want to uh, fixate on that? Um, what is like the, the true benefit? Because I think you brought up these points uh, before about the cons. It's like, we don't have proven benefits, like concretely proven benefits that bringing USDC or bringing USDT natively would actually benefit Cardano. Um, we have to keep in mind that USDC is five years old. Like it, it's not this uh, like really ancient piece of technology that everybody knows. If you start to talk to a lot of businesses outside of the USA, they don't know about USDC. It's so, so new. Uh, and so that, that's why we have a different experience when we're talking with these other uh, companies that we want to onboard. It's like they want something that is familiar, but that familiarity isn't necessarily USDC. Like USDC has its supporters in these tight-knit groups, um, but USDT, way, way more popular. I'd be more in support of bringing USDT. 
Um, but you know, until then, we, we do have these other options. And maybe we can talk more about that later on, um, Farad. But um, that's kind of my two cents at the moment. Thank you. You raise a really great point. Again, I think because USDC or Circle has leverage, we don't know how deep this this um, the requirements that we initially start off with go. Right. Um, one other thing that Sheldon mentioned is that some other chains haven't paid for for integrations. Again, I personally can't confirm that. But if that is the case, it's like then why is Cardano getting this different type of treatment? Um, interesting question, or not interesting question, but something that I want to bring up here. This is a comment from Kappa CX CXS. Can we let USDM do its job and see what USDC decides to do? We have a robust ecosystem in Cardano. Why do we have to dance to someone else's dance? Um, again, a great point. I think regardless of how this entire conversation plays out, um, if Mahen is, is able to deliver in March, I don't think that we're going to see USDC on, on Cardano before then, right? So um, Kappa, I think regardless of how this plays, whether or not we dance with USDC or Circle or not, um, in my eyes, USDM should have that that uh, that early market share, or at least that early launch, way well ahead of integrating something like USDC. Um, I saw a couple of hands popping up there. I know we're supposed to come to Josh next, so Josh and then Trim. Um, so Josh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll try to keep my my comments brief because uh, very similar. Um, we it doesn't bother me that like uh, people don't know USDM. Like, you know, the, the industry as a whole is still so incredibly small. People don't know what Cardano is generally out there. Um, the, the industry is still small. There's still a ton of room to grow. And thus far, uh, a lot of these conversations aren't increasing my confidence with USDC uh, as far as like the, the negotiation deals and, and, and everything goes, because it could end up costing a heck of a lot more than than $10 million dollars. Uh, I, I would disagree with the concept that we need USDC. People know USDC right now in crypto, but people in mainstream crypto right now generally don't like Cardano either. So there's, you know, we could end up paying that that uh, surcharge and and not actually end up attracting any liquidity, any lo new liquidity, anyways, uh, to the Cardano ecosystem. Um, so. I, I'm I'm much more privy to just like, you know, building things ourselves according to our principles that's consistent with what the ecosystem is trying to do for the world. Uh, and and you know, we can we can still build something that is competitive with a lot of these major stablecoin companies that uh kind of monopolize the industry right now. So um yeah, I, I don't think we need USDC. The the industry is still early as a whole. Thank you, Josh. And before we go over to Trim, I just want to again thank everybody for tuning in. Um, we are at about the 50 minute, 50 minute mark. We're still going to jump into the positives and potential drawbacks of homegrown stable coins, right? Um, shout out to Matt Plowman here, representative, CEO and founder of Mahen, as well as uh, Matt Tristan, um, one of their developers. Um, we do have over 130 viewers right now watching. If you guys are enjoying this video, please make sure to smash that thumbs up. Get the word out there. This is a nice and healthy conversation. Again, we have some of the leading experts here on both sides of the equation, um, really making their cases. Again, this is not to say that one person is wrong or that one person is right, um, but this is just to have an open dialogue and have everybody really chiming in. So I'm enjoying this chat. Hopefully the viewers are and hopefully the panelists are as well. Um, just to, to kind of um, set the stage, I know we haven't heard from Matt Tristan. I think we'll hear from him when we talk about Mahen in just a second and just the homegrown fiat back stable coins. And we've also got Michele. We're going to be uh, looping him in here as well as Matteo to talk about um, some of the smart contracts that they've worked on in order to allow for some of these ERC-20 tokens to be adopted here on Cardano. So um, I know you guys have been a little bit quiet, but I want to say that, you know, I do appreciate you guys joining us here as well. Okay, um, let's turn it over to Trim, and then we're going to do our lightning poll, and then any closing questions or uh, comments surrounding pros and cons of USDC or some of just the major stable coins. Trim, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll try and keep this very brief, but I wanted to reiterate this, you know, point that was made, which was actually brilliant. That you know, okay, everyone in the Web three space knows about USDC. Nobody from outside the space knows about USDC. It's you know, as you say, just a couple of years old. Um, but one of the good things about the uh, you know blockchain industry and you know sort of the, this this world that we're working in is also one of the you know things that we really need to to watch out for because 
as we're sort of seeing now, a lot that there is a lot of brand familiarity with USDC, but we have to sort of be careful not to allow that to sort of monopolize the market because you know as you say the reason they can come into these negotiations with you know this this long list of requirements and you know adding stuff along the way and you know these really harsh NDAs and sort of all, all of this this you know stuff that was was mentioned is you know because they 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 feel like they can and the reason they feel like they can is because there is no sort of anti-monopolistic regulation or anything that they have to adhere to in this space right because it's it's not really established properly so i i think you know having a healthy competition is is really good also you know this this eight figure amount if it's 10 10 million dollars that has to come from somewhere and you know okay are, are we okay with uh issuing a 10 million dollar sell pressure on the ada token to bootstrap the liquidity of usdc and you know as was also brought up a lot of the surrounding ecosystem in you know the evm chain world isn't particularly fond of cardano so are they going to come in here with liquidity? Is that going to be drawn out? What's actually going to happen there? I don't know. It's it's. I I think that you know we should look at the numbers. We should run the statistics and see. Okay, in the past, when USDC has been added to a chain, adjusting for market movements that is affecting everyone, has liquidity actually gone up or you know stayed the same or even gone down? You know, and not just look at a few specific cases, but, you know, okay, look at all the deployments of USDC, try and normalize for these market moves and see, okay, is there an actual impact on average? Or is it, you know, just the odd case where, you know, suddenly everyone sort of comes flooding in? I, I'm i open to, you know, seeing the positives for this because I, I'm sure there are positives. You know, this cross-chain uh, transfer protocol, for example, is fantastic if people use it. But you know, I I would like to see the actual numbers run, like before I, uh, before I change my mind, sort of firmly in, into the the camp of okay, this is actually worth it. Fair points raised. Um, if I'm not mistaken, when I asked Charles about that, he did mention that Frederick Regard, head of the CF, has run some numbers. Um, again, I don't think that any of that has been shared with the public, but it does seem like there's at least behind closed doors, some number running to make sure that this hopefully is, is not just a positive for Circle, but also positive for the Cardano ecosystem. Um, with that, we're going to jump into the second lightning poll. I think this has been a really good conversation. And so I want to just go ahead and just kind of do the same thing again. We'll kind of start off with trim at the top left-hand corner there and then work our way to the right and then down to the second row. And this question is going to be, is USDC a net positive or a net negative? Again, um, not to stir the pot or not to do anything like that. You just give us your, your response and this is an open floor um everybody has their different reasoning but that's okay this is why we're here so trim, trim we'll kick this off with you and then for the viewers um i've just kicked off a second poll which should be available so if you guys are watching live right now make sure to go ahead and tune in with your responses there as well yeah uh, i think it's too early to tell honestly mateo um i probably same if i really have to choose net positive robert I would say positive, but too expensive. We've got Matt. I would also say positive and too and too expensive. Same same uh, same idea. Yeah. Positive. Michele? I don't really have an opinion. So if I saw the the poll, I would ignore it. <laughs> Fair enough, Josh. Uh, I I have no clue. The, the numbers aren't there. And and for me, that's the problem. Um, I think due diligence needs to be done first before I could properly answer that question. I, I agree with you there. I would say net positive, generally speaking, but I feel like there's just a lot of unanswered questions um, regarding stipulations, et cetera. Uh, Matt Plowman? This is whether USDC would, would be a net positive or not? Correct. I would say not. Okay. And then Sheldon? Uh, I would say yes, it would be a positive purely for community sentiment and the choice to be able to provide more choice for the community. Thank you all. Um, taking a look right now at the results as they're coming in from the viewers as well. We have 74% for net positive with 26% for net negative. All right, let's move into the third portion for today's live stream session. Again, thank you to all the panelists for joining us. Now we're gonna be focusing more or less on the pros and cons of homegrown 
um, stable coin initiatives, right? As I mentioned before, we already have IUSD, we have JET, we talked about USDA not too long ago, and then we're now expecting USDM. I think that's been really where a lot of the eyes have been. Um, I got to sit down yesterday with Matt Plowman, their CEO and president, who's here with us right now. So thank you, Matt, for that chat yesterday. That's actually one of my best performing videos next to the one that I did with Tem um, talking about one chain, right? So I think, again, that goes to just corroborate the fact that any content right now surrounding these topics are huge. And a lot of the comments can be very contrasting at points. Um, did you want to, did you want to say something? No, just pointing out Tim. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you both. Um, those chats were really in depth for me. For anybody who hasn't checked those out, definitely please make sure to go ahead and check out those videos. Um, the chat with Tim was surrounding one chain, what they're doing here in terms of bridging assets. And then we also talked about USDC circle, et cetera. And then very similarly with Matt Plowman, I sat down with him yesterday and he talked to us about, you know, USDM, how it's going to work. Um, they're on ramps, off ramps, you know, KYC, AML. And then we also talked about USDC and circle as well. So it's been really good to talk to some of these experts again to get their insights as to what's going on now jumping back into the sexual topic here you know the first pro with respect to homegrown staple coins something like usdm something like usda is the fact that it's community backed i don't think it needs any sort of um proof here cardano's community is one of the biggest right anytime that there's a poll the cardano community shows up anytime that there's fud right? The Cardano community shows up to the point people have even begun to, I think, exploit that against us, right? Where they put out foot on purpose just for the sake of the Cardano community reacting to it. Um, so that's the first, I would say, and the biggest thing is the fact that it's going to be community backed. Second would be the fact that it doesn't, or that a lot of the homegrown stable coins, at least that I've heard of, I haven't heard of one yet that would include, you know, freezing clawbacks or blacklisting. So that I think has been a positive um, when looking at some of the homegrown stable coins. Next, we have the fact that Cardano keeps its reputation. Again, a lot of people talk about how adopting USDC would stain what we have here in Cardano. And so if we don't go that route, Cardano keeps its reputation, even though we've kind of taken that slow and um, steady road. We, we have the respect. We know that we're doing things the right way. We know that we're taking the decentralized approach and having everybody chipping in as opposed to, quote unquote, taking a shortcut, which is what some people would label USDC as. Again, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just laying, laying down the facts here. Next would be low barriers to minting, right? One of the biggest drawbacks to USDC is the fact that they only allow certain partners to mint. Now, some people would chalk this up as an actual positive, right? In the sense that this would lower overhead as well as uh, make it easier to make sure that USDC that's coming on can be verified because there's only certain amount of players being able to mint versus a homegrown stable coin where that barrier might be lower, where an average person, for example, like myself or anybody else here on the panel could actually go ahead and mint their USDM or their USDA, et cetera. Now, the one downside to that is that that could potentially introduce more overhead risk in terms of management for KYC and AML. Um, so I want to kind of lay that out there as well. Jumping over into the cons here, right? So the first con of a homegrown stable coin that I've seen with my comments has been a smaller initial liquidity boost. Again, Circle boasts $29 billion in their reserves. Um, I sat down with Matt Plowman yesterday. I'll let him kind of speak for himself here. I don't want to jump the gun, um, but it doesn't look like Mahen will be able to launch with that amount of liquidity early on. Again, let's be clear here, early on. That doesn't mean that Mahen can't get there after the same amount of time that USDC has taken to get to where they are. So I want to be clear about stating that as well. Next would be smaller funds to handle legal matters. Again, because Circle is such a big entity, they've been around, they've kind of been tried and tested. That doesn't mean that they're uh, invincible. And I think Trim kind of mentioned that earlier, right? But with a newer platform or a new player in the game, if they were to go through some uh, legal issues, could that potentially drain them, therefore taking funds away from developing in other areas of their protocol? Um, next and closer towards the end here is less likelihood of wider adoption interoperability, right? So the thing with Circle or ESDC is that it's coming from the outside. It's coming from ecosystems that Cardano hasn't actually been connected to. Whereas if we're getting a homegrown stable coin, it's going to be having to reach out. And as many of you guys here know, a lot of people that are outside of Cardano aren't really too keen on looking into Cardano because again, they're already kind of aware of what's going on in the blockchain space, right? So that's a hurdle that we would have with the homegrown staple coin is the fact that reaching out to the broader community would be a little bit harder and then interoperability would be a little bit harder, right? As an example, take USDA or USDM. If it's homegrown here, how do we get that on EVM networks? 
Who do we have doing the pushing to make sure that it's inter integrated correctly? Who do we have reaching out to protocols, making sure that they're aware of these options, right? Uh, as opposed to the other way around with USDC, which is already known, integrating it to Cardano. The very last thing I want to uh, mention, it's just been the, the current track record, right? So in my videos, I see people saying, hey, we've already tried IUSD. They've had some minor issues with depegging. We've already tried JED. They've got um, some issues sometimes from time when their ratios go down and people can't admit. You know, if neither of these two have kind of gotten the job done, why are we so confident that new and upcoming players can get the job done? So that is that that is the points in cases there for the pros and cons of um, homegrown stable coins. Again, I'm just the messenger, but at this time, I want to turn the floor over to anybody who wants to chime in. Um, Matt, if you want to chime in, I'll give you the the, the honor here. If not, um, we'll turn it over to anybody else who wants to do it first. Let, let's let somebody else go first. I've been I've been in the chat trying to you know work work with some questions. People are asking about centralized exchanges and uh, and Mihen, and so I'll, I'll let somebody else lead the conversation, then I'll jump in. Yeah, not a problem. And for the viewers, and Tim will come to you in just a second. For the viewers, do leave your comments in the replay or in the chat, excuse me. Um, what I'll do is I'll actually highlight some of them and then we'll give, um, whether it's Matt, whether it's Tim from OnChain or anybody else here that's on the panel, an opportunity to respond. Um, and then I did see a, a comment earlier that came in um, about the ERC-20 portion. So um, you guys, please bear with us. Once we're done with this here, we're going to turn it over to Mateo and McKelly to talk about those smart contracts. So um, before we jump into that, though, Tim, over to you. Yeah, thanks. I think I just wanted to start with a uh, general comment about the topic, um, which would be pros and cons of homegrown stable coins. Um, obviously, I think a lot of us have in our mind USDM, people on the call, and also, you know, it's the the native um, to Cardano fiat backed stable coin that's coming up right now. Um, but some of these things that we have listed here, whilst maybe true for USDM, are not necessarily true for all types of homegrown stable coins. You know, there's nothing stopping a homegrown stable coin from having like freezing and, and clawback. So if we're doing this type of comparison, I think it'll be important to, to differentiate you know, the specific decisions that one particular product is making if it's not something that is you know, inherent to the, the blockchain itself. Um, but with that kind of out, out of the way, you know, I think I'm sure most of the people on the panel are going to agree as well is that we want to see um, these homegrown things come up as well. Um, separate from the conversation about whether USDC is a, a net positive or a net negative, um, I think you'll find a lot more agreement that no one is really pushing for a singular solution to the sta stablecoin problem. You know, it's there's there's great positives to having things like the synthetics and multiple different fiat backed stable coins all operating in a vibrant ecosystem. You look at the other um, blockchains that have a larger, more vibrant DeFi ecosystem, and it's not a singular uh, solution. You know, USDC is, is big there, but as was mentioned earlier, you know, USDT is even bigger and you have, you know, massive um, synthetic or algorithmic um, stable coins as well. There's DAI, uh, we know what happened with UST, but for a while that was that was also a very popular option. And then there's numerous smaller options, and they're all they're providing different pros and cons and attracting different types of users. And together, you know, they're they're resulting in this vibrant ecosystem. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to say for now. You raised some great points there. Um, again. I think you're right. The, a lot of the focus in the conversation has been around USDM, which I think has confirmed that they're not taking that approach to the clawbacks, the freezing and everything else. But you do raise a valid point that um, it, they're, they're the exception, not necessarily the rule, if that makes sense here. Um, and I appreciate that there. I'm seeing so many questions and comments coming in here geared towards Matt. Um, I see him trying to answer. Maybe we get, because again, he's been a little bit quiet, yeah. a, a take from yeah, e either you or the other Matt. Go ahead. I'll, I'll go first. So, you know, I, I want to say the a lot of the concerns are real. Um, you know, they're realistic. We are an upstart. We are smaller than Circle. Obviously, we don't have you know giant bags backing us. We don't have huge deep pockets. But you know, we we are we are well funded through Catalyst, and we have you know great builders from the community who are willing to step up and get this thing off the ground. You know, as a team. Um, 
and when it comes to raising capital, maybe we haven't done as good a job of that as we could, but you know, we'll be having investment opportunities coming soon. Um, so that's, that's something that is, is really on the horizon. The, the benefits and drawbacks though, of a, of a native fiat backed stablecoin are, are pretty, they're, they're pretty big. Um, you know, the benefits largely that the focus of, of, of a native stablecoin or native project is Cardano first. So if you look at OSCII, you look at, you know, you look at Indigo, you look at what Optim has done, you look at any of the DEXs that are on Cardano and the wallet makers on Cardano, they are all here to build and support the future of Cardano. And if a homegrown stablecoin is the one that should, you know, be the, the, you know, the sort of the ecosystem king, I think that would be the best thing for Cardano simply because, you know, not to I pump my own bags or show my own thing, but, you know, that's where incentives are aligned. You know, our incentives would be aligned with Cardano's incentives. We wouldn't be a small side project that we had to get bribed to go and do. You know, it's not like that at all. So that's really the, the, the big difference, I think, is the upside being that whenever we go to try to do a community event or we try to do something within Cardano, it goes back to supporting Cardano. You know, the liquidity that would come from a sta fiat backed stablecoin would come from the users of that fiat backed stablecoin, like by definition. So the liquidity would come from people who are on Cardano. So why shouldn't that liquidity recirculate? Why shouldn't the interest on those dollars go back into Cardano based projects? So that just seems like a, a nice alignment of interests. So I think that's the biggest pro, I think, for me. You know, there's certainly the cons are we are small, we are startup, we are. Um, you know, we are working through the the legal challenges. We have good experts. We have good, you know, good team to to overcome these challenges. But I think that assuming the challenges are overcome and things are, you know, working and launching and moving and those types of things, which we're you know, we're totally on track. You know, the the upside really is that Cardano first, Cardano Cardano first, Cardano first. Thank you, Matt. Um, we haven't heard from Matt Tristan yet. I do want to give you a fair opportunity to speak. Um, so go ahead and feel free to do so now. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this topic. I think the main problem we're solving is we have we have the problem solved of getting Beller um, representations on the blockchain, right? Like even the like we have Jed, and even though IUSD has depegged. All that IUSD is still backed by a dollar worth of ADA. So it's still fundamentally backed by a dollar. So we have we have the ability to do um, dollar representations on the blockchain already. I think the problem we're really solving is we're solving capital efficient uh, dollar representations. So when you use um, Jed, for example, for every dollar that you want to mint, you have to put up $4 for IUSD. For every dollar you want to mint, you have to put up a dollar fifty. And another thing with that is, is both of those assets, they have to be backed by ADA. So not only do you have to over collateralize it, but the person on the other end over collateralizing has to be of a certain personality that's willing to be long on a volatile asset. And there's a lot of people like myself that are willing to do that but it's there's not enough people to really bring in um a lot of liquidity into the ecosystem and so, so because of that i think you know having a fiat backed stablecoin particularly usdm i know matthew plumman discussed a lot of the alignments we are an ecosystem first we're a community first project uh we think that's the main way to get success on cardano um but really i think that's the problem that we're solving we're solving capital efficient representations of the dollar on the on the Cardano blockchain. And I think that's going to be our biggest pro when we launch that we're, we're capital efficient because we're backed by the dollar. Great points there raised by, by you, Matt. Um, I appreciate that. I think a, a lot of where the concern comes in from the community, again, this is what I'm seeing on my content is with the fact, and Trim, I'm coming to you next, um, is with the fact that these these rollouts take time and just like how there's uncertainty on the other side of the equation about usdc and that bringing 
mass adoption, liquidity, et cetera, that USDM, USDA, you know, JED, IUSD also have some of, some of, somewhat of the same issues. And so I wanted to, to voice that there. Trim, I'm going to come to you next. I want to prepare the panel here for our third lightning poll. So the third lightning poll, and this will be posted to the viewers as well, is are homegrown stable coins worth the time and money invested given the risk and their current track record so far? Just like with the prior poll, this is independent of USDC this time. So whether or not we have USDC, let's say USDC doesn't even come here. Are these homegrown stable coins still worth the effort, time, et cetera? Um, the last question was the same way. We were taking a look at just whether or not USDC was a net positive or negative without comparing that to the homegrown stable coins. And so I want to do the same exact thing here. Are these homegrown stable coins worth it regardless of whether we get USDC or not? So before we get to that, Trim, we'll turn it over to you for um, uh, uh, in, for your input here. And then we're going to take that uh, that lightning pole. And then we're going to jump into uh, Mateo and McKelly's uh, smart contract developments. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to, to hearing more about that. Because one of the things that I, I want to highlight about these homegrown solutions is they were they're following the you know basically cardano principles right and one of these principles is having native tokens which is not really something that happens on every chain so for example on evm chains you don't really have tokens you have smart contracts representing tokens which you know i'm really recommending anyone who hasn't seen it yet to go and, and see the um, the interview you did farid with uh, with matt plomin uh, you know that really sheds some light on what's actually happening there. When, when, on Cardano, when you're transferring a token, you have a token that only you have the ability to, to send and receive, or you know, you've received it, you're the only one who can send it somewhere. On an ERC-20 style token contract, it's it's a completely different uh, you know, perspective. It's, it's a different thing that's happening when you're transferring a token. So, you know, having a... a native solution for this sort of really highlights this this uh, sovereignty and you know self ownership of the assets uh, that, that is involved in in addition to that I, I also wanted to highlight that you know with iusd and jed one of the problems with uh, well first of all jed being an algorithmic stable coin a lot of people got really shook by um, by the fall of ust Right by by the collapse of Luna and sort of all, all the things that happened there, and now when they're hearing the word algorithmic stablecoin, they're thinking, oh, you know, this is this is unsafe, right? Whereas the actual design of Jed is much more sort of elaborate and I would say more secure than what Luna was dealing with. Much less exposure to the volatility and the actual minting of the Jed token, as long as the minting is is available, is actually. One dollar to one dollar. You you don't have to put you know the, the four dollars up to to mint the actual Jed token, but you know someone else has to do that with a Shen token. So it's sort of a I, I get the capital efficiency argument there, but one of the problems that IUSD uh, that we're seeing with IUSD and also with Jed is this the pegging, but in different directions. Right, Jed tends to have a peg that's above a dollar. IUSD will tend on average to have a peg that is slightly below a dollar, because there's you know this arbitraging mechanism to sort of bring the price either up or down or sort of you know, back to that exact dollar peg is not really in place with these protocols in in you know especially not in the uh, situation that we're in now with with jed for example where you're unable to mint more jed so you're not able to sell jed on the market and bring the price down so therefore it will sort of stay a little bit above it similar thing with iusd you're not able to redeem the ADA if you don't already have minted IUSD previously. So, you know, these are sort of the forces that are, are lacking in a way to, to bring to, to stabilize the peg at exactly one dollar. So that, that is also one of the one of the benefits of having a, a fiat peg stable coin on Cardano because we don't have those solutions in the shape of a stable coin at the moment. And um, you know the these having one that is based on the Cardano native asset standard i think is fantastic you know uh, i'm really looking forward to to hearing more about this this uh, smart contract based standard for for you know for tokens and that is part of the innovation journey of cardano right proposing new to new token standards new ways of dealing with these things um but you know seeing something that is 
using the stuff that we already have, which is, you know, really fundamentally um, building up under this, you know, self-sovereign, owning your own assets, you know, being your own bank kind of, uh, kind of narrative, I think is very encouraging. And, you know, you don't need to have these clawback mechanisms in the token itself because you're controlling all of this stuff, all of the KYC, all of the AML happens at the off-ramp and on-ramp stage, not at the token transfer stage, which is something that I, I think is, uh, you know, in, in my opinion, better than, you know, the alternative. But of course, there is room for everything, right? Thank you for that, Trim. And I would really recommend for anybody who wants a little bit more insight on what Trim just talked about at the very end to watch that interview with myself and Matt yesterday. Matt raised some really great points about why um, why it makes sense for entities like Circle and Tether to actually have some of their freezing and clawback mechanisms and how that actually ties a little bit back into um, the account-based model on EVM networks as opposed to what you just mentioned there, Trim on how things work on Cardano, where you're actually the owner of your own Cardano native assets. So as we get ready to jump into the third poll here, um, I do want to just give the viewers a heads up. We're about to talk to Michele and um, uh, Matteo here. You know, web, web zombies, we will be talking about Chain and how to get over that bridge phobia. That's going to be after we get done with this following segment here. And then another question coming in from BG, why is there so much fun negativity in the space around Cardano? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's a great question. I think it's because we're doing things right. Sometimes people feel threatened and um, that just could be a, a natural response. I think a lot of the times the, the FUD coming in from the outsider, from people that don't understand. I, I appreciate that, Josh, you agreeing with me there. And so we'll just kind of leave it at that. So anywho, um, we're going to get ready for our next lightning poll before we turn it over to Michele. Michele, as a heads up or Mateo, if you guys have anything you do want to share on the screen, you should be able to share um, or at least present your screen. So you can go ahead and prepare as we get ready for this next poll. And then as soon as we're done with the poll, you guys will be the stars of the show. All right. So with respect to just focusing on the Cardano ecosystem itself, regardless of whether we get USDC or not, you know, are these homegrown stable coins worth um, the continuous time investment um, given the risk and just their track record so far? Um, Trim, we'll kick it off to you at the top left-hand corner there, and then we're going to work our way down. And for the viewers, the poll should be starting any second now. So Trim, kick us off. 100% worth it. UGS, of course. Yeah, that's why I work every day. So of course, yes. Can you remind me what the question is? <laughs> um, are are homegrown they, stable coins worth worth the risk, given you know what we know about them so far and what we've seen? My answer is easily yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes, even if we if we in the possibility we get USDC, I think uh, homegrown stable coins are are worth it. But yes, we, we must be onto something. If Michele can answer this one confidently, I think we're doing our job. Josh, over to you. Definitely, yes. Of course, yes, here as well. Yes. Uh, I think it's going to be a wash. Big yes. Uh, yeah. Yes for choice. Yes for competition. Yes for homegrown. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Awesome. It's really good to see that regardless of this entire conversation, right, regardless of whether people fall on the side of pro USDC, not USDC, that we can all at least come to agreement that stable coins on Cardano, the homegrown ones do need to be a focus moving forward. So now that we've walked through the foundation, laying down the problem, we've talked about pros and cons of USDC, pros and cons of um homegrown stable coins. I want to turn it over to Matteo and Michele. Michele representing Harmonic Labs and Matteo representing Fluid Tokens. They've been working on an interesting smart contract. So I'll turn it over to either one of you to kind of just break down what this is. I think the community is excited to find out more about it. Right, right, right. Let me quickly recap what we're doing, basically. So last last summer, as Fluid Tokens, we were building a smart contract type that was that we called Soul, Soulbound NFTs to sort of anchor the user to some uh, tokens that cannot be spent. Because the problem, as Trim already said, which is not a problem, but is an issue in this case, is that in on Cardano, native tokens are not programmable. So you cannot stop them. You cannot decide when to send them or to do stuff when they are sent, right? And at the same time, Michele was working on basically the same exact solution, but also proposing a 
improvement proposal for Cardano, a formal one. So when I saw that uh, in December that we were building more or less the same thing, and, and Michele was far ahead in the proposal, we, we just decided to merge the efforts and actually do it. And uh, Michele will speak more about the technical details now, I guess, uh, but the concept is just a, a new approach, a new version of tokens on Cardano that resembles more the uh, account-based model on EVM, on Ethereum, for example. And uh, it can coexist with the native tokens on Cardano, and uh, it could be a good solution for USDC if one of the other requirements are uh, to have the freezing option from Circle, right? If if we don't need that, then native tokens could be the actual solution and it's even better, but it seems that it's uh, still one of the big conditions here. So I let Michele now explain briefly how uh, the technical parts works. Thank you, Michele. Sure. Well, so the, um, the, 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 the thing is, uh, I, I, I imagine everyone here uh, on, on this call is uh, aware of the differences between the uh, native assets on Cardano and ERC20 assets on EVM chains, uh, but I'll quickly explain for anyone who is listening. Um, on Cardano, we did, a, in my opinion, a great thing of having uh, assets that are actually uh, recognized by the Cardano node, by the ledger. So uh, a node who when sees a music source, it knows that there is some value there, which uh, consists of uh, ADA, level assets, uh, and recognizes also that that music source has some other kind of token. So the node actually knows about the token on a new TXO. Uh, this does not happen on uh, EVM chains uh, because, well, first of all, they do not have UTXOs, um, but uh, the, in order to implement token, uh, they had to come up with a standard. So something that everyone uh, agrees on how to write this uh, set of contracts so that if these contracts uh, do respect this, this, implement, this standard implementation, uh, a wallet is able, as an example, to recognize that contract as a uh, as an asset. So in in Ethereum, as an example, there are no such thing as assets at least recognized by the Ethereum node. Uh, rather, there is the contract which is keeping track of uh, the amount every uh, user has of that given asset. So this is the best, the, the, the essential difference uh, between Cardano tokens and Ethereum token. Because they have a contract, they also can, when, when a transfer happens, can add some additional code. So a transfer is essentially uh, remove the token that are being transferred from the, the sender account and add the token to the receiver account. So it's really simple. Uh, but since it is done in, in a contract, then you can add additional uh, constraints uh, to the transfer. So you have program effectively uh, programmability over transfers. Uh, and this is something that we instead uh, do not have on Cardano because there is no contract. Uh, the, the tokens are essentially on your uh, UTXO, and uh, that is why uh, Cardano tokens are called native. So now that we know the difference, uh, we know also that uh, Ethereum, to uh, Ethereum tokens are essentially just a standard. And if we want, we can have a standard here on Cardano too. So if we want to have uh, Ethereum token as they are implemented on Ethereum, we just have to come up with a standard and uh, accept it and uh, write contracts that are uh, do respect this, this kind of standard. So there would essentially, at least from the user perspective, not be any difference uh, with Ethereum tokens. Or if you ever have used Ethereum, uh, you know that uh, in order for your wallet to uh, keep track of your uh, assets, you need to specify uh, the, the address of the contract. This does not happen, of course, in uh, Cardano because of uh, how, how it works. And if we implement ERC20 tokens also in, uh, in Cardano, we would have to do the same thing. Uh, the user would have to specify the address of the contract so that the wallet will be able to track the amount the user uh, will have. Now, there are some key differences uh, also in matter of security. Um, la, la, in Ethereum, the first, uh, the, the, the RC20 standard uh, includes something like uh, transfer from and approve, uh, which are uh, which have an historic uh, historically have been the cause of lots of green transactions. 
so when coming up with the standard, there was uh, also a lot of conversation with other uh, notable uh, developers uh, of Cardano. So uh, one of the ma main differences that there will be with ERC20 token on Cardano and other ERC20 is that there will not be something like a transfer from or an approved. Uh, so that users that want to transfer uh, tokens always have to sign uh, the transaction. So uh, we are somewhat strict, uh, a, a bit more strict on, on that requirement, but is in line with uh, the way native assets work, as an example. So the the core of uh, of the proposal is essentially this: taking the RC20 standard on other chains and since we have smart contracts that are able to do anything that is possible on another chain, also on Cardano, just replicate that that uh, standard, uh, of course, with uh, some changes where uh, appropriate. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them. The I, I want to be precise. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the um, uh, yeah, I want to be precise. The the the, the standard is not just specifically. Uh, to bring over USDC is rather uh, to be able to have an option of having programmability over transfer, so to emulate what is possible on other chains. Uh, that should be it. I hope it was clear. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Michele and Matteo. Um, I am by no means a developer. I know that there's much brighter minds here that can kind of maybe give you more specific questions about how the smart contracts will work themselves. I, I guess my question would be much more general, you know, when, the, when can the community get their hands on something like this and, you know, what else is left before you guys can actually ship this out for everybody to take a look at? Uh, so there uh, is already, okay. Well, there, there is, a, there is already a, a proof of concept in our contract. Um, some time ago, I, I did some tweet showing transaction happening on Cardano or following the standard proposed. Uh, that was both well I, uh, on preview, but I did it also on on pre prod, so it should work without uh, any problem. Also, mynet since pre prod is essentially mynet, it's just testnet. <laughs> uh, but yes, um, this the standard and the possibility, the ability to do it uh, is here. Is already here. We do not need to change the the ledger. We do not change uh, the we do need we do not need art forks. Uh, it was possible to be honest since Basil. So um, regarding that. The possibility of, of when technical when is technical technically feasible, it is already feasible. Uh, if but if Matteo wants to add anything, yeah, just just to add, we we basically the, this the improvement proposal is already here. It's been discussed and it's been bring brought forward. And at the same time, we are building a demo for the average user to actually use it and play around to see this actual movement of uh, tokens in the RC20 standard. And they will be probably out uh, by the end of this week. And we'll try to put, publish also source code and all the stuff to try yourself also on your own uh, next week. Thank you. Um, before we turn it over to any questions here on the panel, there is one that's coming in from Roki. So he asked, does this feature take advantage of the new smart contract bridge feature? I think that was Milkamata or that was a Milkamata development. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can answer that. Uh, no, it, it, every, everything is uh, native uh, to Cardano smart contract. So it doesn't rely on uh, bridges or any, I don't know, solidity contract. It, it is just written well, in this case, the contract was written in uh, PluTS, uh, which is in TypeScript, but uh, anything that compiles down to UPLC can be used. Uh, so it does not rely on, on that kind of technology. Thank you both gentlemen again. Um, any questions maybe from some of the more technical minds here about this, the smart contract and maybe expectations or how it operates? Go ahead, Trim. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I uh, I don't want to you know uh, take up uh, the whole space with with technical discussions, but I'm just curious about how many you know user balance pairs you can support in, in something like that because you know there, there's a uh, obviously a size limit to to the metadata and everything. So yes, you know is is there are you running into problems there or are you sort of running a binary tree or, or something to sort of scale that? Uh, no, every every uh, account that is created just generates uh, a new UTXO. 
So there, the, there is an account manager contract that keeps uh, one UTXO with uh, as datum just the credential of the owner, the amount that it has, and eventually some state for some additional uh, some additional checks that uh, some specific implementation might implement. But there is no map, no no gigantic datum. Uh, so uh, the, the theoretic limit is uh, how many UTXOs we we can create, which uh if, if we we did us the chain uh that is a much bigger problem than than this uh this okay uh, can i ask you just a follow-up question as well yeah. because let's say that i don't know there are two thousand of these uh protocols or tokens sort of launched and um it, it's you know widely adopted yeah. is it going to be you know do you imagine us having to sort of add these man like track these manually in your wallet or is there some sort of you know way where you're getting an actual token that sort of represents okay this guy has some balance in this token and then you check the contract to see what the amount is or because you know adding these things manually I can manage imagine being a yeah. big hassle uh well the, the way the way it works on other chains is just uh, that you add it manually otherwise the uh, something like metamask won't be able at all uh to uh to know there is something there uh, however, uh, we can come up with a standard on top of the standard, which requires when creating an account to uh, send some kind of NFT that says, okay, look, this, this wallet has some address there. So it is possible, it is feasible. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see any complication with that. So if we want to, we can have it uh, for this standard as it is for now. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't require it, but we can have it. Thank you for the solid questions over to Matt Plowman. And then we're going to jump into the last segment for today's live stream, which is surrounding bridge phobia. Everybody who's scared about bridging assets, whether it's stable coins or just regular tokens. But over to you, Matt, first. Is there a need to update the DeFi ecosystem to accommodate this kind of a token standard? Um, no, uh, because, well, this the standard as it is designed uh, allows for other contracts uh, uh, well, as I said, th this kind of implementation is already possible uh, with with the Vasi lab fork. So technically, it's already feasible. And as it is designed, it allows also for other contracts in the same transaction. And in even, it, it even allows for contracts to hold uh, these kind of tokens. So it, there will not be uh, a need to redesign uh, contracts. The maybe uh, only need would be to, to write some contract that is aware of these other transactions. Uh, this other contract in the same transaction, but uh, and anything that is already here, it, it doesn't need to be changed uh, as long as it is okay to having this other contract in the same transaction. It basically adds a, an, another layer of complexity in general for uh, the Phi protocols to, to manage this. But if they follow the standard, it shouldn't be too complex to add it. And of course, this is the best solution we have to add programmability to tokens on Cardano for now without changing the architecture. So if there was a limit on the transfer of the tokens, how would somebody interact with the DeFi protocol under the standard? Well, the if, if OK, I get what you if If, as an example, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong. If, as an, as an example, this programmability of a transfer requires that you can only send 100 USDC, uh, how would some protocol uh, respond to that? Is that is this the question, right? Well, it's, you know, what if Fareed is uh, on a sanctions list and we can't send him any of the token? Yes. So, uh, so, so um, how does he not get it from a DEX? Yes. So the um, uh, this falls perfectly in, in the example implementation uh, that I wrote some days ago. Uh, in that in that implementation, there the, the, there are examples where I create a, 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 an account, I mint some tokens, and I'm able to transfer the, some those tokens right away. But then, if I change the state of uh, that specific UTXO, and then that UTXO becomes becomes frozen, uh, then uh, tran trying to call the transfer uh, transfer transaction uh, will fail the entire transaction. So uh, if some user that is trying to uh, spend uh, some uh, frozen asset uh, in that case, uh, the entire transaction will fail. Uh, on, on something like Ethereum, w that would revert. That means that you also have to pay the fees, etc. Uh, in Cardano, fortunately, we, we do not have that. So we, it will just fail and the, the assets are locked as, as long as the 
uh, this state is like quote unquote frozen. Okay, thanks. All righty. Thank you, Michele. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to be hearing a little bit more about this, especially once this starts to go mainstream. And just again, as more people get their hands on it, um, like I said, I'm not the most technical person here. I love diagrams. If you guys have any diagrams you guys are able to share with me, I'd love to cover this in a separate video on my channel here moving forward. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this will bring us to the end here. Um, and I do just want to just do something a little bit different. Um, we're going to be talking about bridge phobia here. And then I want to go ahead and get the closing thoughts for anybody that has to run first before we jump into the community Q&A. So again, thank you to everybody for tuning in. This has gone a little bit longer than I would have expected, but it's all been really, really thoughtful and um, really, really eye-opening for myself to say the least. So the very last topic for today's um, stream is going to be bridge phobia. So as I mentioned, you know, and this is not to single out Wan Chain by any means, but I think they're kind of the, the the group that has the eyes on them, right? Very similar to homegrown stablecoins and USDM having all the eyes on them. Uh, when people are just generally talking about bridges, there seems to be some sort of stigmatism as to actually utilizing or adopting, you know, tokens that come from a bridge. Of course, we've seen uh, multiple hacks on networks outside of Cardano. Um, I think the one that's really gotten closest to Cardano was the um, one chain, not the one chain, excuse me. I apologize there, Tim, your, your camera went off and my, my mind went to one chain was the nomad bridge hack on uh, Mil Milkameda. And so we saw, you know, a couple of platforms, which include, I think, um, wing riders, which are affected and some stable coins from uh, that bridge, which also impacted. I want to turn this over to you and maybe I'll, I'll give you, Tem, the opportunity to kick this off because again, I think you've got probably the most experience here. You know, how can we remove the stigmatism from bridges on Cardano? Again, not even just focusing on stable coins specifically, but just around bridged or wrapped assets. Sure. Yeah. I was sweating a little bit because I knew this was obviously uh, <clears throat> coming my way. And then my system started freezing. The camera went off. I was like, oh my God, they're going to think I ran away. <clears throat> but uh, anyways, yes, I'm, I'm happy to kick this off, off for us. Now, there's obviously some stigmatism around the word bridge. There's been just too many hacks over the past 18 months, two years. It's really been a black eye, not only on bridges themselves but on the industry as a whole you know these and DeFi hacks are basically the easiest way to to get headlines in the mainstream media because the numbers sometimes are just astronomical and uh, you know everyone likes a bad story um, but i think ultimately it's just going to have to be a matter of a education and then ultimately abstraction um, I will preface by saying, if you believe that interoperability is a necessity, and obviously at OneChain, we believe that. I personally believe that if blockchain is going to reach widespread adoption, interoperability has to be part of the equation. Now, maybe maybe we need to abandon the bridge terms because it's just gotten too dirty. Maybe we need to um, call it a router. You know, People in Web2 are more familiar with that because uh, they all have one in, in their homes, because that's basically all a bridge is trying to replicate. Um, you know, at Wanchain, I'm not going to go into too deep for us because we're talking generally, but we're trying to design it to be as dumb as possible. Um, you know, we just want to take some data on this chain and replicate the data, you know, as much as possible unchanged on another chain. Um, it's not about wrapped assets. This is just one implementation. You know, wrapped assets are just a data structure. Um, you know, things like oracles, these are kind of the same thing as bridges. Um, the other thing I'll say, you know, so we can get other people to chime in, I think maybe it was Trim, I'm, I apologize if it wasn't you, but um, earlier in the call brought up the issue with UST and Luna and when that collapsed and it created, um, you know, a lot of distrust in synthetics and, you know, something like JED and IUSD, which may have a superior design, are still suffering from that. Um, I would say bridges are, are as, if not even more complicated than, than synthetic assets. And there is a lot of variance in terms of how different bridges work. And it is um, an unfair task to ask general users who just you know, want to move things between chains to really understand deep down um, how each different bridge works and also to understand the various risks with different bridges. Um, so in that case, I think ultimately, it just all has to be abstracted um, where the user doesn't actually necessarily know what chain different transactions are being taken place on. 
Um, they're just interacting with the application of their choice. Obviously, we're very far away from that. But bridges, they have a stigma, but they're core infrastructure for the future of blockchain. Thank you, Tim. Very, very well said. Um, Trim, do you maybe want to respond to anything? Um, anybody else want to chime in there? Um, yeah, as sure. you said, oh, go go for it. Yeah, so, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No. Um, but yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And it, it's kind of like, um, I feel like blockchain bridges are a bit like airplanes, right? Tremendously complex instruments that sort of, you know, help you transition from, from A to B. And, you know, most of the times, completely fine. Absolutely, you know, marvelous and sort of enabling you to travel the world and, you know, like work for me personally, who's, you know, traveling a lot for work, doing that without airplanes, it just wouldn't work, right? But they are also a great example of, you know, spectacular headlines when they fail. And a lot of people get very antsy when, when these headlines come, right? Because, you know, it, it's big news that the images look horrible. You know, you, you can have big headlines with big numbers in, in the Bridges case. So it is very important to keep in mind that, you know, these things are most of the time, you know, completely fine. Uh, there are, of course, these examples where things really go bad, but, you know, it's, and it's the same thing with the algorithmic stable coins. Exactly right. Like, so Jed has a much more stable design. I, I remember looking at the design of, of Luna and UST and thinking, oh, they're, they're way too exposed, right? This design is not going to work. And, you know, lo and behold, it didn't. And at the same time, I was reading the, you know, the white paper for Jed, and I was like, hmm, you know, this makes a lot more sense because you have this sort of volatility absorbing layer in between, which you know you kind of have to have if you want to try and do this thing, right? Um, I, you know, I'm personally, well, professionally, I would say, uh, involved with building bridges, right? So um, I cannot say too much, but you know, I'm, I'm working uh, on sort of partner chains and sort of the that initiative on, on specifically on the, on the bridges side. And, you know, I, I do think that when you bring in newer technologies and, you know, there's a lot of innovation happening in ZK and, you know, in using trusted execution environments and different sort of technologies that can sort of make this process as safe as it needs to be for it to be safe to abstract away. And I really like this idea of, of, you know, abstracting away this, this, this mechanism, like, are you on this chain? Are you on that chain? Like, are you on Midnight? Are you on Cardano? It doesn't really matter. Like, if you're able to interface with the same wallet, you're able to pay the fees with the same, you know, tokens that you have, it doesn't matter where these transactions are actually routed or how sort of everything works, right? It, it, imagine if you're able to use, you know, something like your, your NAMI wallet using ADA and paying for stuff and, you know, it, would you care if the swap that you were doing happened on a DEX on, on a separate chain, like, I don't know, Ergo or Avalanche or something else, right? Would you actually care? Like, if, if you're able to swap token A for, swap, for token B, you're paying with the stuff that you already have, using the tools you're familiar with and, and you know, comfortable with. Um, and as long as everyone everything's sort of happening underneath is safe, it's fine, right? It, it's enabling you to sort of explore this world and and, and really... Um, and enabling the, the sort of the sort of travel basically for, for for the people in the ecosystem. So yeah, I, I I really like this idea, and and I do think that you know it might be a good idea to to think about a rebranding because the, the brand the, the the bridge branding has just been so tarnished, and it's also kind of focusing on the wrong thing, right? Like routing is a, is a much better term because then. You're not focusing on like, okay, I have my tokens over here. I'm going to move them across this bridge over here. And it, it really enforces, uh, reinforces this separation between ecosystems instead of like, okay, you know, I'm go I have my tokens over here. I want to do this thing over here. Or, you know, I want to do this thing. You, you don't even think about it being over there. It just gets routed for you, right? So I, I do think that, you know, it would be healthy for, with a kind of rebranding there. Thank you, Trim. As we get ready to take any sort of closing comments surrounding Bridges, and then we'll jump into actually closing out the uh, live stream, at least the official portion before we jump into the q and I want to go ahead and just launch the very last lightning poll. Um, Trim, you just somehow always happen to be at the very top there. So may maybe we'll just go backwards. We'll start with Sheldon at the very bottom. There, He's been quiet. Um, so has Matt Tristan. But 
in Q&A, you guys have the opportunity, if you guys are watching this live, to hammer these guys with questions as long as they don't have to run. This has already gone on a little bit longer than expected. But the very last question is, have you ever or do you plan on actually utilizing a bridge? So if you're watching this live, make sure to go ahead and um, respond to that poll. Sheldon, we're going to start with you and then we're going to work our way up um, to the left this time backwards um, with McKelly next. Uh, yes, have used a bridge, but I probably don't use them as much as I should. Um, it's something I got to do more of, but as of right now, yes, minimum. McKelly. Yeah, same here. I have used occasionally a bridge, uh, but uh, not not uh, a daily user. <laughs> For myself, I have used a bridge. Um, I would echo what McKelly has said. Definitely not on um multiple occasions it's been more or less just just to try them out maybe create content around different bridging providers uh but after having spoken and i'm breaking my own lightning lightning pull rule i'm, I'm expounding after speaking with uh Wan chain i would definitely want to make more content and just familiarize myself with bridging again i think it, it starts with us here right if we want to remove the stigmatism um i can't just tell people go use a bridge i need to go use a bridge so over to you josh yeah, I, uh, I have used a few different bridges on a few different occasions, not without like vetting it and make sure that there's a history first, but yeah, I've used them. Uh, yes, I have used them in several different blockchains and particularly with one chain uh, with uh, different clients and also internal projects as well. I've used a bridge to bridge um, world mobile token into the Ethereum network. So that's an example where I've used a bridge, yes. I own a couple thousand MAD USDC, but other than that, I, I've never actually used the bridge to get the native asset across, no. Is that worth anything anymore? I'm just gonna hold on to it and wait for the class action <laughs> lawsuit against one chain corp or whatever. <laughs> fair enough fair enough um robert over to you yeah i've used bridges a lot over the years i mean yeah working with mint i, I would hope that you use bridges if you wouldn't that'd be a red flag um tim over to you same thing yes <laughs> yeah i mean you you work for one of the biggest bridge providers so um pretty cut and dry there and then trim you work for iog i can take a guess as to what your answer is <laughs> yeah, I, I've used a couple of bridges and I've designed a couple of bridges at this point. Awesome. Yeah, take a look at the, the response coming in from the community. I mean, 64% says yes. That's actually a little bit higher than what my comments would reflect because every comment that I receive is like, I'm good. I've been burnt. I don't want to utilize, utilize a bridge, etc. So uh, we have 100 concurrent viewers right now tuning in. Um, I hope you guys have found some sort of value from this awesome panel here. Shout out to everybody who's tuned in. I mean, such a huge representation of the Cardano community. At this point, I want to turn it over just for you know a quick round of closing comments from everybody here. And then we're going to jump into the community Q&A. Once we get closing comments, guys, um, you guys are more than welcome to drop if you have to. I know this is a weekend. You guys have your families and other things to tend to. Um, but if you guys do want to listen into the community and just kind of answer some of the questions, I'm sure that they would also appreciate it. So, McKelly, I did see a couple of questions, I think, that were aimed at you. Um, I'll try to see if I can find them. I've definitely seen a ton coming in from Matt Plowman, so I think you'll probably want to stick around and answer some of those questions. Um, and then I've also seen a few as well surrounding bridges. So maybe, um, Tim, if you got a little bit of time to spare, that would be appreciated. Um, this time, maybe we'll, we'll start from the top, you know, Trim. Um, we'll try to keep these to about two or so minutes, you know, any closing thoughts just surrounding the state of Cardano, the state of stable coins? You know, what do you want to share here with the community? <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think we're, you know, we still need fiat backed stable coins for sure. I think the, the home cooked versions that are coming are going to be absolutely fantastic. You know, I am familiar. I know the team that's making Mehan. I know, you know, the, the Oracle team that, you know, uh, that they're using Charlie three. Um, you know, I, I, I sort of, it's a small ecosystem. I know most of these guys and I, I really trust them. You know, I've seen, it's not just that I trust them personally, but I've seen the designs, I've seen the tech they're using, and it's you know hard for even the teams making these things to to try and mess things up if they tried to, right? So it's really high assurance, you know, stuff we're making, even though it's you know it doesn't have the biggest liquidity in the world, but you know it will come over time. I'm I'm, I'm sure. Um, this whole USDC thing, I do think we need to verify. You know, is it actually going to bring in liquidity or not? I don't know. Maybe 
I, I would like to see some numbers run on that before you know we go and spend ten million dollars of of you know selling pressure on Ada for to bring them in and sort of uh, agree to all of these terms. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I'm really optimistic about the the state that we're in. Thank you, Trim. I believe Tem is next, followed by Robert for closing thoughts. Sure, I'll just start by uh, thanking the rest of the panelists. This was a, a great talk, and I enjoyed myself. Um, I guess the, a parting thought would just be to reiterate a bit of what we said uh, in passing whenever we switch topics here, is that we're not in a either or type of situation. You know, when you're thinking about USDC, it's not USDC versus something homegrown like USDM versus bridges versus synthetics. Um, obviously, if we're talking about uh, an expenditure, you need to, you know, weigh the ROI on that. But if we're fast forwarding and looking at what's the best case scenario for the Cardano ecosystem, it's multiple options, multiple versions of each type of option and a really vibrant ecosystem. So, you know, whether you have a, a favorite one or a favorite option, to me, that's almost the wrong way of, of looking at it. You know, you want the best version of each type that you can get. Thank you, Tim. Over to you, Robert, for closing thoughts. Yeah, I think this has been like a really great discussion today. Um, I think Matt Plemon made like a really good point earlier on is like the reason that we specifically are here, why, why I'm here is like, I want to bring options to Cardano. Like I am Cardano native and it's not that, you know, we have this idea and I'm looking for a blockchain. It's that we have this blockchain that's brilliant, has a lot of features that we desire. And now we have to figure out how do we use these tools so that we can get the most out of it. And it comes up with a lot of challenges. Like Cardano is built different and that's why it takes longer for us to do development. It's not a, a quick thing. So all these stable coins have taken time to come on board. So we launched MyUSD, um, you know, Jed has launched, IUSD has launched, Mehen is about to launch. These have taken time and is going to continue to take time. Um, and all of these are, are really great options. And from my perspective, you know, it really doesn't matter what who the winner is, you know, what options are ultimately available. If USDC comes, USDT, if um, you know, JED becomes dominant, um, because my focus has always been on the interoperability. So as long as we have these options available for Cardano, then we should just be able to exchange them uh, seamlessly across different blockchains. And we really have to get over this hurdle of Cardano being its own isolated islands. And I think that's where a lot of these calls for USDC to come because they see USDC as this interoperability beacon where uh, suddenly it's now connected to 10 different blockchains. And that has a lot of benefits, but there are other ways we can go about doing that. So it's a matter of, you no, know, do we have these centralized bridges such as Circle, or do we focus on the decentralized versions such as WANChain or, you know, the alternative versions that we're building here at Mint? Um, ultimately, all these options are good. It's like the, the more competition that is, the better it is for the users. Like we want Cardano to succeed in the end. Well said. Matt Plowman, your turn. Um, yeah, let's echo what a lot of what Tim said and the um, you know what uh, what Trim said. The the thing about Cardano is it you know we, we as as Mihen has built um, a number of integrations with other you know trying to work with other uh, providers. So for example, we tried uh, doing tokenized equity. We tried raising our raising capital and having them tokenize it for Cardano. And all of the providers that we spoke with were, you know, unwilling, even though they tokenized equity on Ethereum, they were unwilling to modify core systems to accommodate uh, Cardano, one project, one small, small customer on a blockchain that's, you know, that's, that's kind of on its own, um, in its own architecture. So the, the lift of changing the, 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 uh, the existing systems to accommodate Cardano probably speak a lot to why some of these 
other ecosystems, core providers aren't launching their products on Cardano. Now, I think that just ends up you know, forcing the community to come up with its own creative solutions. I don't think that Jed would have been created from any other community. I don't think that that sort of, you know, kind of alpha token, beta token, stable token, volatile token pair uh, model, you know, would have been tried in other ecosystems. So it's very nice that Cardano has this sort of forcing mechanism to get it to bring its own solutions to bear. And I hope that we can make a difference um, in that with, with the USDM project. And I hope that as we go forward, we can make a better product that will outcompete with any big player that should come on simply because we have the better tech and we have the better reserves verification mechanism and we have the better community support. So that's that's really kind of the the hope for, for USDM. And to the extent that USDC might bring new users, might introduce new people to Cardano, you know, th that's that's great. Um, I think that in any case, you need to have a lot more, a lot more uh, availability, a lot more options, a lot more, you know, uh, diversity of stablecoin options on Cardano to, to meet all people's needs. Yeah, as we saw with that poll earlier, I don't think there's any <clears throat> second guessing whether or not, you know, the community wants to see homegrown stable coins come to fruition. Um, so, yeah, we definitely wish you the best in the entire Mahen team. Um, I believe it is Josh LGC that was next. Uh, my order got a little messed up here. So, Josh, hopefully I'm not throwing you on the spot, but um, we'll, we'll go ahead and have you next, followed by Mateo, then uh, Matt Tristan. Yeah, uh, I will. I'll round us out just very generally speaking uh, from from my perspective. I've got an opinion on things. I, I there are ways that I, I think some things are better than other things. Uh, but ultimately, what I'm here for is is the decentralized systems that we're building. And that means that everybody gets a voice, everybody gets a say. So by virtue of you listening to conversations like this and uh, by participating in, in these different things. That's that's really what I'm here for. However the cards land, however people vote, whatever the voice comes out to be, I'm here to support the, the right for that. And in that process, I'll also voice my opinions as well. Uh, so that's that's what I would encourage you to do. Like whatever, you know, if, if you land one way, consider another side, vote based on your philosophy, maintain the integrity of your ideology. Um, that's, that's the most important thing when it comes to conversations like this. So that's what I would ask you to do. Nice way to round us out there. Josh has a lot of, uh, professional experience when it comes to debate. And so, um, not surprised how, how he's able to kind of put those words together. And if you guys aren't aware, he's also a fellow content creator here operating late game crypto. Make sure you go ahead and follow him on YouTube. Um, he and I stream pretty often here. So if you guys are tuning in here for the first time, you might not recognize him, but, um, definitely make sure to go ahead and give him a, a look on YouTube as well. Mateo from Fluid Tokens, over to you. Right. So just to wrap it up is I'm very optimistic about the Cardano space in general. And because as we see, we saw today, we have many smart minds that are working on the problems and there is a very good uh, constructive discussion on all the issues that we may uh, face, right? And uh, regarding USDC, I also would love to see some estimates, uh, some numbers, uh, but, and also uh, from my side, I see clients that still request it. So, I'm sure that the estimates would go in that direction to to have it at least. I want options and everybody I think wants options in Cardano. And lastly, regarding the bridges is uh, stable coins was the topic of today, but let's let's remember that bridges are super important also for all the other uh, types of tokens that can be bridged. So they have a wider scope more than the stable coins bridging, uh, which is super important because, Yes, stable coins are crucial for DeFi, but uh, tokens in general are also super important for all the blockchain that exists. Thank you, Mateo, representing Fluid Tokens here today. Um, I gave you a congrats on the Twitter space, but I want to go ahead and just highlight you here as well. Uh, Mateo, the Fluid Tokens team raised over $4 million in less than 18 hours, and I think one of the fastest selling LBEs done on MinSwap ever. So congrats to you and the Fluid Tokens team. We're all looking forward to your contributions to the Cardano ecosystem. Yeah, it was a huge feat. It was a huge Thank feat. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the team. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, Matt Tristan, over to you. Yeah, I think to kind of conclude my thoughts, you know, I think 
you know, there's definitely room for more than one um, stable coin on Cardano, more than one different kinds of stable coin. I personally, I use IUSD a lot. I think, you know, it, it's, it's a really cool stable coin if you know how the protocol works. And it's also a very cool um, trading tool as well. Um, I'm really excited to get Mehen launched and, you know, have a proper fiat back stable coin on Cardano. And uh, I think it's going to be interesting to, you know, see how everything plays out in the future. But as an avid DeFi user, I'm excited for it. Josh agrees with you there. We're going to have to get everybody some uh, 10 out of 10 signs for the next three. <laughs> um, thank you there, <laughs> Matt. Um, again, I know you've been working very closely um, with obviously this other Matt, and then there's a third Matt um, with the Sunday Swap team to make sure that, you know, Mahen's vision comes to fruition. So we thank you all for your hard work and wish you all the best. Michele from Harmonic Labs, any closing thoughts? Yeah, at this point, I don't think there is much more that I can add. Uh, maybe the only thing uh, is uh, about having options. Uh, that is why the ERC20 uh, standard is proposed at all. Uh, we have a perfectly working uh, way to having assets uh, on Cardano, in my opinion, even a superior one, red, uh, if compared to the RC20. Uh, the RC20 standard proposed uh, is uh, only to allow uh, this other option of uh, doing, uh, of releasing an asset. So just uh, for closing off, this should be uh, some, something to keep in mind. Uh, the main goal of uh, the proposed ERC20 uh, proposal is uh, of giving the option uh, of whoever wants to come, uh, not only USDC, uh, whoever wants to come in Cardano, to do things as they prefer. Uh, of course, uh, but evaluating what are the trade-offs. Uh, but that is something that is implementation specific. Other Thank than that, uh, was a great, great time here. Yeah, no, thank you. And I appreciate your contributions. As I mentioned, you know, um, I'd be more than happy to cover the, the token standard to the best of my abilities, um, given the proper resources. So don't hesitate to reach out. You know, the bridge is now open. Um, I look forward to connecting and, you know, seeing, you know, how far you guys are able to go again, yourself and Mateo. Um, last but definitely not least, Sheldon Hunt representing the Intersect MBO. You know, what are your closing thoughts surrounding the, this entire conversation today? Well, I would just start off by saying it's it's awesome that we're all, I think, in alignment here. Like, of course, we're all on this panel, and there is usually quite a bit of agreement. But for this particular topic, I know there could be some divisiveness online. But for the most part, when we get into the, the nitty-gritty details, I think it was expressed earlier as well, it's not an either-or situation, which is wonderful. Right? And we kind of nail it through and, and find out that we're actually all going to be richer off by having us all kind of have these options on the table, uh, having a competition and being able to collaborate. The amount of like, collaboration so far on all of these various things has been awesome. Um, and I know like people talk about, and it's maybe also like grandiose that we said, oh, this is going to be the year of DeFi, or it's the year of on-chain governance, or, it's the year of real world assets or whatever. Um, if anything, it's like here in 2024, it's going to be the year of all of that. And it's going to be the year of stable coins. I can't think of like another time in Cardano when it, there's been so much on the line uh, and everything is now like interconnected. And so this year is going to be fabulous for the amount of developments. And I would just encourage everybody, everybody listening, everybody involved in this to go and support each other. When these projects are, are launching, you know, throw in a little bit, have some fun, experiment, help each other out, you know, test it out. Uh, and then share your experience. Um, and I hope to have more of these conversations going forward. I, I look forward to perhaps having a, a roundup a year later uh, and seeing where we've come in this whole topic. And so thanks again for hosting. You're very, very welcome. Um, I definitely would be more than happy to host all of you, you know, maybe like you said, in a year's time to see what has transpired and where everybody kind of stands with all of this. Um, I also want to just say thank you, Sheldon, as well. I know you were kind of traveling here on the road. I think you're the only person here on mobile. And so you've been holding your phone, I think, for like the past two hours, right? Uh, so you, your arms are probably drained, uh, but I want to say thank you again. This was a huge, huge win for, I think, the entire Cardano community. I'll do my best to, again, get this out, share it out. So much insight, so much knowledge coming again from some of these leaders and key um, key 
key influencers, right, when it comes to staple coins, Cardano, Smart Contract and Development, Bridge, all of this stuff. So thank you to everybody for making the time to join us here. We did run a little bit over, but this, this again, the fact that not a single one of you dropped shows how dedicated the entire community like is. I'll be honest, I would have expected at least one of you guys to have dropped by now, but that's not the case. So 10 out of 10, everybody, kudos, you know, pat yourselves on the back. Um, at this point, though, the, the stream is quote unquote, you know, wrapped up. We've gone through everything that I wanted to chat. So at this point, we're going to turn it over to the community. You know, I see Roki, I see Trim, um, I see Matt. He's been working in that chat, man. Uh, we got to pay you for that, Matt. Um, he's been answering questions. But if anybody <laughs> has questions, you know, for any of the gentlemen up here, now is the time to go ahead and get them out. We're going to um, just kind of just take a couple of questions here, probably for the next 15 or so minutes. And then we're going to go ahead and wind things down. So, um, again, it's been a really, really solid conversation at this time. I mean, you guys feel free to unmute yourselves if there's anything that you guys want to chat about that you want to highlight. You know, this would be the time to go ahead and do that. Well, maybe I'll uh, jump in just to say, I got to go. My hands huh? are so tired. <laughs> You're good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, But it has been here. wonderful. You guys are awesome. Uh, looking forward to more conversations like this in the future. And uh, keep up all the awesome work. You guys Thank you. Sheldon, I, I jumped into the Intersect uh, Discord to ask you about the worst stablecoin working group. Well, Meehan was uh, you know, one of the founding members of Intersect, so we're interested in being involved yes. with those, those conversations, definitely. Absolutely. It wouldn't be the same without you. Need it. So yeah. On Monday, Thank let's uh, let's set up a call, all of us. But yeah, you guys take care. Yep. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Right. We got we got Mikami. Anybody gonna watch Royal Rumble tonight? I don't know, man. Um Trim, go ahead, man. Unmute yourself. Yeah, no, I, I was just about to say if we're done with, you know, the 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 serious part, I, I just want to highlight one thing that we do have a Pretty good stable coin already on Cardano. It's backed by exactly what it claims to be backed by, and then you know it's pegged to zero. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, what? There's no way. <laughs> I should yeah. have known. Oski <laughs> plug. <laughs> you know, we did say no shilling, but it's not my project, so you know. It's, uh, Fair, enough. You that's Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, Oski so is now uh, live on multiple chains since you can uh, bridge it with one chain. Mm -hmm. Really. I didn't realize that that but was that was a dollar. <laughs> yeah, it's spreading. It's the, you know, there's no containing Hosky. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Spreading the poo everywhere, man. <laughs> uh, we, we, we have we have a serious question coming in though from Ben. So Ben's asking, are are any of you thinking about a Euro stable coin? So maybe you know Matt or um, Tem, if you guys have dealt with like bridging some sort of Euro back stable coin. So to to. Go ahead and answer this question. Yeah, the protocol was designed generically enough that we could have any stablecoin um, that we can regulate, that we can, you know, issue in a way that's compliant. And all we need to integrate it is just an oracle um, from a reserve to that stablecoin. So it's possible. But right now we're focusing on USDM and getting USDM launched. Yeah, and, and like a, on a on a real serious note. Um, I was, I was up, I was up, like got up in the middle of the night, couldn't sleep. And I was kind of doom scrolling Twitter. And I came across about 10, the same circle ad 10 times. And it was encouraging the U S regulators to get on the ball and come up with some reasonable stablecoin legislation that could be used for, you know, forwarding dollar dominance in web three. I think a big part of the reason that the dollar is the predominant currency of the world is because it's the currency in which oil is traded and most other natural resources and commodities including gold and uh, base metals like um, like copper are all traded on the dollar. So as the dollar becomes a preeminent currency for international exchange, it becomes a national, natural reference currency for the world. But in Web3, that is unconquered ground. And if the dollar wants to maintain its global preeminence, the US government needs to come up with some reasonable regulation on stablecoins that will make the dollar stablecoin the most attractive regulatory environment and most attractive base currency for all stable coins. The European Commission is coming up with rules to implement the, uh, um, was it not MIFID? Um, MICA. The to MICA, MICA, yeah, MICA, the MICA rules. And in, in, in frank terms, uh, from a regulation perspective, a Euro stable coin is far, far more 
uh, comfortable uh, to launch a euro stable coin. So if we had European presence, if we had the ability to uh, you know get licensed in a European jurisdiction, that would be the easier path to follow. And I think that the U.S. risks losing the the ground in this area to Europe or to potentially other other countries that have uh, you know better um, better adoption of their base currency in Web three. So. It's it's a serious question. Uh, we part of our catalyst proposal was that we promised to open source the token design, open source the smart contracts that control the minting and the burning, and the oracle, um, you know, the oracle uh, reporting the reserve balance. And so that's like, like Matt said, that could be used for a euro based stablecoin or any other stablecoin that references an off chain pool of assets. You know, be it gold, be it you know dollars, euros, yuan, yen, whatever. So yeah, it, it can be a multi-currency. You know, it wouldn't be USDM as multi-currency. It'd be like you know, EURM or whatever or somebody else wants to use the open source smart contract. They could do that too. I, I feel like all stable coins have been focused on the US dollar. You know, could there be some market share to be had by launching some sort of other fiat-based stable coin where there's less regulatory hurdles, which it sounds like with the euro, that could actually be an opportunity. So interesting perspective from, from you there on, on that, Matt. Go ahead, Tim. I was going to add, um, you know, Circle themselves have a Euro-based uh, stablecoin. Um, I believe so does Tether. Uh, um, Circle is URC, E-R-E-U-R-C. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, that could easily be bridged to to Cardano. There's no technical hurdle. It's mostly just about user demand. And importantly, if there's any dApps that kind of want um, exposure to to our Euro stablecoin, because that's really where it comes from, you know, as, I, as I've... Um, said a few times in this call and, and the last, you know, bridges are just infrastructure. Um, just so there's no difference in moving uh, a euro stable coin versus uh, an American dollar stable coin. Uh, but those st- those types of stable coins are out there. Of course, the liquidity is less than than the big U- uh, USD stable coins, um, but they're out there and uh, could easily be bridged to Cardano. Thanks for the heads up. I wasn't aware of uh, Circle's euro backed uh, stable coin. Interesting thing to note. Another question coming in, um, Trib. I know you're pretty familiar with Jed. This states: Do you think Jed will will be stable if the dollar would collapse due to its design? Um, I would tend to think no, but I could be completely wrong here. Um, I, I mean, in that case, define stable. Right? Is it stable <laughs> against the collapsing dollar, which is itself not stable, or is it maintaining a different kind of peg? You know, it's both are kind of bad, right? Um, no, no. The the answer is no. Um, if the dollar the collapses, if the dollar collapses against ADA, what that means is ADA moons, and then that case the Jed would remain stable at a dollar because there'd be plenty of ADA in that pool to meet your redemptions. Yeah, for sure. And uh, also, you know, a coll- collapsing dollar is probably more like a you know decade long process, or you know, as we've seen, a couple of decades already. It's a long and slow process. It's not like, okay, you know, on, on Thursday, it's going to go down. <laughs> yeah, no, interesting, interesting. I didn't even think about what Matt just mentioned there about um, the value of it against the dollar. I was just thinking solely about the dollar. And if that would to crash, then I would thought I would have thought that Jed would have crashed as well. But yeah, um, on, on a more serious note, though, like mm-hmm. technically to, to you know, reference Matt's point there, um, the Jed protocol works with an oracle that tracks the price of, of the dollar and the exchange rate between you know the dollar and and USD. So that's that's how the redemption mechanism would work. So you know the, the oracle would update, and you would be able to, you know, yeah, it would follow the price of the dollar basically. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, this I think may have been from McKelly a while back. This I mean was almost this was around the time that he was speaking. But I think does this apply to what you'd mentioned with the smart contracts, McKelly? Yes. So. <clears throat> The question is, can a centralized party also withdraw funds uh, or only freeze? Uh, that is, that would be implementation specific. So there is the standard that uh, specifies uh, how to transfer, how to keep track of uh, the amount of uh, token each each account has. Uh, but other than that, the standard doesn't uh, force anything else. So if uh, some specific specific implementation of the RC20 standard. Uh, wants to include this kind of logic. Uh, at this point, is no different uh, than uh, a, smart, a DEX smart contract, as an example. If a DEX smart contract only wants a set of batches to perform the batches, then only those batches will be able uh, to uh, keep 
keep the protocol going. So uh, yes, that, at that point is just like uh, a normal smart contract. Uh, if the logic uh, says that a centralized party can do that, that the, can do those actions, then it will allow it. If it doesn't, then uh, it won't. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there's another question here, and this is actually pretty interesting. Let's see um, what you guys. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to jump ahead. in. Here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, Michaela, we probably should catch up offline, but uh, I just had a question. Could two separate token, you know, token um, contracts reference the same UTXO? So a user has, you know, let's say that USDC, just to take an example, is implemented in this way. And the user has USDC, so they have this UTXO that is sort of representing the, their, their ownership, right? But it's, it's not in their wallet. Yeah. Could a separate token contract reference that same UTXO so you could reduce this uh, min ADA UTXO thing. So, you know, effectively you could have multiple of these things referencing the same thing for a single user. Uh, yes, uh, at, at the end of the day, they are just UTXOs as, as any other UTXO. So uh, this kind of UTXO can be used as reference input, inputs in other transaction is not a problem. Uh, Eventually, eventually, they can have, they can access uh, that UTXO in the same transaction as it is being transferred, and that can be checked uh, using redeemers in this script context. So yes, um, the, the fact that it, uh, the standard as it is doesn't uh, restricts the number of, of uh, contracts in the same transaction uh, make it make it makes it uh, pretty uh, flexible. That's that's pretty interesting because then you know. Say a couple of of tokens come together to collaborate, or you know, we even establish a standard or something for how to to do this thing. Then you could you know do airdrops more easily because you you circumvent this min ADA UTXO. You know th that is is you know kind of preventing this in, in in a way for some users. So the users who would be open for that would basically get one of these tokens, and then you know you could leverage the same UTXO and just you know have more tokens that can then airdrop to this wallet basically yes uh well uh, i'm i'm not sure i understood i understood the, the question uh at, at, at this point uh no, no, no that's fine uh, you know actually let's catch up off the line uh, that, okay, i think sure. that would be fun yeah so we can explain that uh, that, that makes sense yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if the community doesn't have any fresh questions coming in, I think we'll probably just take one or two from uh, about 10 to 15 minutes ago, and then we'll go ahead and let everybody go to enjoy the rest of their day. Um, let's see here. So I think it's Julie. This is the person that asked about uh, the depegging of Jet earlier. Um, is there already is there already thoughts of making a Jet-like stable coin not pegged to USD or the Euro? But more stable than the average of some basket of tokens. Um, yeah, Robert, I think you're making or like you guys have a stable coin backed by stable coins, right? Yeah, I mean th this is exactly what the grand vision is, right? So, you know, phase one is just a stable coin backed by other stable coins, but long term we have a synthetic asset that's backed by a basket of commodities. And this allows us to move beyond the dollar, move beyond the euro. So, you know, next stage is just going to have a, uh, a basket of fiat currency. So we have the euro, we have the yen, we have the dollar. And now you have this kind of average stable, uh, stable coin. Then you get away from a, a centralized uh, point of failure. So if any one of those currencies collapses, then you still have some amount of stability. So that's like the definitely the direction that we want to head towards longer term. And it's quite interesting. Um, what are the technological capabilities we have available? Like, do we use JED mechanism? Uh, Indigo has a mechanism. Butane is implementing some mechanisms. Um, beyond Cardano, there's some also interesting algorithms as well. Um, so this is definitely feasible because you know we will be launching a euro stablecoin like we have the dollar stablecoin already uh we have the technology available to make the euro stablecoin if we have these two baskets available we can combine the baskets and kind of average it out it all just depends on our user demand so 
when we think of composable DeFi, it's just we're building out these tools and then we'll see what actual users in the real world want to use. If they want to use these baskets of assets, it absolutely will be possible. Yeah, that's a really interesting concept. Um, I wonder, Robert, you know, has this been done on any other network before? Um, because again, I feel like it, it's a really solid idea, right? You guys are basically taking an aggregation of all the stable coins and building a stable coin backed off of that. It has, but it's failed. So um, th this is a problem in general with synthetic assets. Like basically, what I was alluding to right at the very beginning is that we have done all these ideas before, but almost always they lead to failure. It's the same with the bridges, right? You know, why do people uh not like bridges because all the bridges up until now have failed us and eventually we're going to get a good bridge you know that could be wen chain it could be um, rosen bridge um we're going to figure out you know what's going to last the test of time the same as with synthetic assets so there have been some other projects on other blockchains that have done um like indexes so um, many many years ago um uh, maybe yes, eight years ago, uh, I was working on bringing uh, a cake, uh, an index to the Ethereum blockchain. And so that's kind of like a, a similar concept. And then there's um, uh, another one that I played around with uh, a couple of years ago was uh, having an index for the whole of the crypto market cap. So if you want to say make, take a bet on the growth of the crypto industry as a whole then typically bitcoin would be that vehicle but you could also just do the whole market cap so if you have a whole market cap and it's like 1.5 trillion or whatever it is then you'll have that uh synthetic asset that tracks it and there have been other projects that that done this it's just none have really gained adoption so that's really what we're going to be uh, kind of that's the, the big question. You know, if we build this, are people actually going to use them and are they going to, are the algorithms going to be actually reliable to be usable? Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, again, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, type of adoption Mint gets moving forward. I know the past couple of weeks, there's actually been more and more conversations and I'm seeing your guys' name just naturally pop up. Um, for anybody who missed my interview with Robert, we dive into just everything that Mint is providing and that's listed on the channel. I think we'll go ahead and just take one more question here. I mean, this was uh, one that came in from Roki earlier. Let me get my screen up here. He wanted to get the panel's thoughts on this graphic here, right? And this is highlighting networks that share developers. And obviously, as we can see, we've got the island here, right? Um, so maybe just very quickly, if anybody wants to just give it a shot as like, as like what, what's your thought about this diagram? and you know, how are you processing something like this? Yeah, maybe um, being uh, actively working on an alternative language for Cardano, I can have here. Go for <laughs> the, it, yeah. The yeah, the, the, the thing is um, that Cardano has uh, a different ways, a uh, different way of, of doing a lot of stuff, like a different way of, of keeping track of the, the amount of value uh, a user has, uh, a different way or a different machine for running contracts, uh, a different uh, uh, ideology around contracts. So uh, in Ethereum, we have global global state. We have, uh, whereas in Cardano, as an example, we, we went for uh, pure contracts, of deter deterministic contracts uh, that are functional. So there are lots, lots, lots of different. So that, that graph was about uh, developers that are working on um, different different uh, blockchains. Uh, and I can see in this graph, Ethereum is pretty central. Uh, and then we the, the main connection it has is uh, are with EVM-like or still um, contracts that are really similar to the way uh, Ethereum contracts works. So that, that um, kind of makes sense. Uh, there is this uh, gap. So we, are, we are a node on our own. But that doesn't mean uh, that doesn't have to be necessarily a, a bad thing. Uh, the, the thing is, we are keeping you are doing stuff differently, uh, but we are moving towards something that is more uh, developer friendly. Uh, we started a couple of years ago, and in two years, 
something uh, incredible happen uh, from the developer experience. That's a great um, response. Go ahead. Go ahead. Fareed, I, I had my head with the window a little smaller on my screen, so I couldn't tell whether that small orange dot to the bottom left was an important blockchain or not. Let me see. Can you bring it back up? Yeah. Yeah, there's one over there, I think, that's orange and connected to something called Lightning and Solana and Filecoin. Um, Is that one over there on the left side <laughs> important? It's not connected to very many others. Um, let me know if you guys are able to see yeah. it. Yeah, the, the I, dark I orange one. Oh, this one? Original color. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My bad, man. I, 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 I was like the last person to catch on. Um, okay. You know, gotcha. I think that the skills that are required to develop on Cardano are unique to Cardano and a few other things. I know that a lot of the banking people that I speak with are pleased with the choice of Haskell. They like the, you know, the the functional programming language. They like the really pure execution of everything. Um, I think that you know, we are still early. We're still way early. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily worry that there's being a lot built on Ethereum. It could be that Ethereum is the next Microsoft, and then we end up being the Google or the Apple or some some other second mover advantage to to being in, in the ecosystem and doing it better the first time. So. Uh, there was a question. Could you go back um, in, in the chat? I think there was somebody asking about reserves. So to be very specific about this, um, the reserves, as we grow the reserve account, it will be a bank account, and then it will be a portfolio of money market fund shares. And so we have a, a trading platform that's called uh, ICD. It's a very large treasury management platform that allows uh, you know big companies will use it to manage their balance sheet treasury uh, cash to move it between money funds based on which yields are better that day or or where they can get capacity so it's um it's a bank account and then it's money fund shares which are required to be redeemed at t plus zero uh, same day redemption and then after we get much much bigger we end up into a, a separately managed account strategy in that case, so so thinking way down the road, there will be an independent valuation company that conducts a portfolio valuation every day. Um, you know that will only happen if there are literally billions of dollars of reserves in the account, um, and it would not be something that I think we're really looking at in the near term horizon. But that will all also be an independent valuation that would be then you know done on the treasuries based on either matrix pricing or amortized cost. Uh, based on you know whether the the assets are of a longer duration or not, and there are industry standards that are taken on a daily basis in the cash valuations group that that are done kind of based on best practices that are that that dominate the industry. So there's there's good valuation uh, stats and there's good good either matrix pricing, like I said, or amortized cost pricing that are uh, are good references for for valuing those treasuries. And then those values then are reported through to the Oracle, which are reported through to the blockchain, all independent of Meehan's interaction. And that's the, whole, that's the important part of it, right? Is to kind of control us or limit our ability to control the outcomes and, and keep them based on the, the, the reality of a situation that, that's, that's on the portfolio side so that, you, that our users can be assured that the portfolio is, or the, the reserve balance is sufficient to meet all of the, uh, all the tokens that are outstanding. Thanks for that, Matt. Gonstein, I hope that answers your question. Um, I know we've been going, I mean, for quite a bit now. Um, we've been doing Q&A for a little bit. And again, you guys have really stood throughout this entire thing. So I just want to say thank you and go ahead and just kind of wind things down. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've got Matt Plowman here representing Mahen, bringing a fiat back stable coin this coming March. If you guys want to find out more about them, please check out my videos. You can reach out to Matt and the entire team. Um, they're very active on Twitter. They're also available on Discord. Thank you and shout out to Robert from Mint. If you guys want to find out more about them, I've got a sit down interview with him as well. Super active on um, Twitter or X. They've also got their own Discord. You can find the links to all of their socials um, in the links of my videos. Temujin representing Wanchain. Shout out to yourself. We had a lot of the Web3 zombies in the chat today. A lot of the Wanchain um, fanatics showing up, right? Um, so that was really good to see that like 
that community travels, man. Like when I post content about one chain, they're all in there. Um, thank you to you. Um, I sat down with you two not too long ago to talk about one chain and what you guys have done for the stable coin ecosystem here on Cardano. We've got Josh from Late Game Crypto, fellow content creator. This is not at the norm for us. We don't typically go this long, but I thank you very much for sticking by and uh, you know contributing to this conversation as well. Trim. Usually it's just me, you and Josh, you know, uh, but now that you're busy, you know, I don't get you, I don't have access to you like I used to. Um, but just today was a really good chat. You know, um, thank you for, you know, taking the time to prepare and provide so much insight surrounding some of these um, homegrown stable coins like you are able to. So I look forward to having you on the channel in the future once you uh, are able to divulge some information surrounding what you're building there with the IOG team on Bridges. Um, Mateo. I gave you congrats earlier, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you guys have Aquarium and all these big things coming out from Fluid Tokens. You guys started off as as just lending and borrowing for NFTs and you guys have, you know, grown to something that is bigger than that, you know. Um, so again, congrats to you. Thank you for jumping on and um, looking forward to what you and McKelly are working, are working to build. We got Plutus Plumbus, man, Meld OG, you know. You, you and I, we got to catch up. Um, it's been a long, long time. Um, I want to say thank you. I know you've been working around the clock to make things happen for Mahen. I've got no worries that you guys will be able to do that. Um, again, thank you for your contributions here. Thank you for your contributions to Cardano. And um, just a, a, I, I hope to see you at future events. I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Because by then, if you guys have launched Mahen, uh, your presence will, will be a lot different than it's been at some of the prior events. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Michele. True. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wishing you the best with your smart contracts. Again, if there's anything I can do to help spread the word, man, please, please, please let me know. And for the viewers, you know, if you guys have made it through this entire, entire chat, I mean, I can't thank you all enough. Um, we still have Dennis in the house. We've got Web3 Zombies in the house. We've got Cloud Macro supporting Wanchain in the house. Kappa in the house. Um, everybody's still here. Um, Curly, thank you all. Roki. Thank you. I know you were here since minute number one. You've been asking for this chat, and I'm glad they were able to make it happen. Hopefully, on the next one, we can actually get you up here. Um, roki has been a huge contributor here. Um, we got Vidi, huge supporter as well. Um, I'm more than happy to bring this entire crew back as long as they're available. That's the biggest thing. I'm available on the weekends. I don't have kids, wife, and all that extra stuff, but I know that all these wonderful guests here do, so I want to be considerate of that. Um, that will do it here. That will do it here. I wish you all a wonderful, wonderful weekend. This has been a blast for me. Um, again, thank you all. For the viewers, please smash that thumbs up. If it's your first time stopping by Dap Sent, you want more content like this, consider subscribing. And last but not least, if you have any questions for anybody here that you guys see on top, go ahead and leave a comment down below. That said, and as always, we'll see you guys in the next video. Cheers, everybody.